We march in our nation's capital to urge our parliamentarians to put an end to this 50-year-long assault on human life. We have got to get back to the basics of life. Life is precious from conception to natural death. Are you ready? You gonna make some noise? Three, two, one. We are the pro life. We are the pro life. The mighty, mighty pro life. The mighty, mighty pro life. And if you can't hear us, if you can't hear us, you gotta get your job Life is on the line. Children are being killed, dismembered in their mother's wombs. There is nothing polite about abortion. Abortion's gotta go! Hey, hey! Oh, oh. Abortion's gotta go! Hey, hey! Welcome everyone to the 2020 virtual rally and March for Life. My name is Matthew Wojciechowski. I'm the Vice President of Campaign Life Coalition and I'm here with my co-host Josie Lutke who is the Youth Coordinator for Campaign Life Coalition. Josie, how do you feel right now? I am ready to do this. <laughs> we have been working day and night ever since we had to make the, the, un, the unfortunate decision to cancel the Parliament Hill rally and March for Life. But I feel like uh, wherever you are right now, if you're watching from your living room, from your kitchen, 
from, uh, from your garage, from your backyard. We hope that you will stay tuned for the whole program. We have an, an amazing lineup of speakers, pro-life experts, politicians, religious speakers and spiritual leaders joining us today. Uh, so before we jump into the program, we're going to cut to a highlight reel from the 2019 March for Life. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the 2019 National March for Life! Greetings, you crazy, wonderful pro-lifers. We march to encourage our pro-life lawmakers, to embolden them, to show them that we will support them. We march to send a strong message to MPs seeking re-election and new candidates that our vote matters and on election day, we will not vote for them if they support abortion or are unwilling to change the status quo of abortion on demand. We will march and we will proclaim, we vote pro-life. Don't pay attention to 100 people over there when you've got 20-something thousand pro-life Canadians right here in front of you. Pro-life is protecting freedom of conscience and, and religion so that people are not required to violate their deepest beliefs, either in the workplace or at school. There must be protection for all people, not only those in the medical world, but for everyone, for the sanctity of conscience so that they may be faithful in respecting the great gift of life. Joe Borowski is remembered for inspiring a whole generation. I'd like to introduce and oh, give this award to Brad Trost. Thank you and God bless each and every one of you for your wonderful efforts. We just sang earlier, uh, O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Maybe we can learn together to sing, O Canada, we stand on guard for life. The father of that child repeatedly returned to the vigil site to thank those volunteers for sparing the life of their child who is now three years old. Thanks be to God. We will not give up. We will not give in. You are not alone. The media don't cover abortion because when people find out, decent people don't like it. I'm the mother to three children. Deuteronomy 30 says, choose life that you and your descendants may live. I have no living descendants. I will be silent no more for my brothers and sisters who have died over the past 50 years and for those that are yet to come. I often hear the phrase, pro-life except in cases of rape. When people say that, I know they're just trying to be compassionate, but they're talking about children like my daughter. She is not the child of my rapist. She is my child. If abortion is going to end, it is not going to end here in the halls of Parliament. It is going to end because each one of you raised your voices and said, enough, no more death, no more evil, not on our watch. We stand on guard for thee. Man, that was a great march, wasn't it, Matt? Yeah, I remember last year, it was such a jam-packed event. We had Abby Johnson, we had the producers of the Gosnell film. We even screened the film Unplanned last year uh, for the first time to like a public audience. So uh, we missed that march, we missed that physical presence. Uh, but we hope that this year, you know, as an alternative, you will still continue to be inspired, motivated, and encouraged to, to create change in Canada. Let us open, as we always do, in prayer, as it is our faith which sustains us. And then following this prayer, we'll have the national anthem. I like watching a masses from Father Mike Schmitz, and he's always encouraging people to participate. So participate in the national anthem by standing it, even if you're at home alone. 
And then after that, we'll have a greeting from our co-chair, Margaret Mountain of the March for Life Youth Committee, not Youth Committee, March for, Life, March for Life Committee. And then following that, we'll have Jim Hughes, the President Emeritus of Campaign Life Coalition, also providing his greetings. So let us bow our heads now in prayer. My name is Pastor Isaac Gimba, coordinator of Meeting Point Ministries Canada. Shall we pray? I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, on whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We lift your name, we glorify you, Lord Jesus. For you are the creator, you are the giver, you are the sustainer. It's you who preserve life. We have come to honor you. We have come to celebrate life, for you are the bread of life. You are the resurrection and the life. I pray for everyone here that we will indeed experience Him who is the way, the truth, and the life. And as we celebrate, as we commemorate this event, I pray your protection over everyone. I pray that your hand will be upon each one of us. I ask in the name of Jesus that we would remember, as you told Jeremiah, before he was formed in his mother's womb, you knew him and had set him apart. And that we will celebrate this life that comes from you. In Jesus' name, Amen. My name is Mark Mountain, and I am the co-chair of the National March for Life and the national organizer for Campaign Life Coalition. I am here to welcome you to the virtual March for Life. Did you know that the unborn child in Canada has absolutely no legal protection? Even during this pandemic, abortions are happening across Canada. That is why we march. Since 1998, we have marched through the streets of Ottawa, bringing awareness to the plight of the unborn child. But not this year. Although the platform has changed, the message remains the same. Parliament must bring in a law to protect all human beings, not just some, but all all human beings from the time of conception until natural death. This year, because of the isolation imposed on us by the coronavirus, we've had to change, but we are very proud of the events that we have brought this past week for you. We miss the exuberance of the young people on Parliament Hill, the inspiring speeches, the camaraderie, the singing, the chanting. But we know that in times like this, we do the best we can. We hope that what we've done will help inform, excite, 
and inspire you to carry on with all you do to help save and bring protection to the unborn child. Stay tuned. Welcome to the 2020 National March for Life here in Canada. My name is Jim Hughes. I'm the President Emeritus of Campaign Life Coalition Canada. Many years ago, about 25 years ago, Miss Nellie Gray, who started the March for Life in Washington, D.C., began egging me on. Why don't you have a march in Canada? Oh, it's a lot of work. I don't know whether we're up to doing that. Come on, what are you, a wimp? And finally, with the encouragement of so many other pro-lifers here in Canada, we started the first National March for Life in our nation's capital in Ottawa. And then subsequent to that, we had marches right across the country in the various provincial capitals. The march uh, has grown, and it's grown from uh, less than uh, a thousand people the first year to uh, over 25,000 at its peak. And it's been a wonderful revelation for the people in Ottawa, the members of parliament and the senators and just the ordinary citizen to see how many people were, are concerned about the plight of the unborn in this country. So it uh, was thanks to Miss Nellie Gray uh, who uh, encouraged me to uh, to do something about this in Canada. And, and here in Canada, Father Alphonse de Volk of the Bazillion Fathers, uh, to whom this march is dedicated this year, was uh, instrumental in uh, encouraging others to get behind this thing. And uh, thanks to Archbishop Terry Prendergast in Ottawa as well, because it was he who worked with the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops and got a lot of bishops to come out to the Ottawa March, and then eventually they were in their own marches in their own provinces. And I want to thank, too, the uh, Knights of Columbus, the uh, Supreme Knights of Columbus in New Haven, and they, they were uh, ex extremely supportive right from the beginning, too. But, of course, the march is all about the people. It's about uh, so many ordinary people coming together, doing the, this wonderful public manifestation in support of children before birth. The other and their mums. And the other thing is, of course, that uh, uh, in addition to this, the the important thing is that uh, as Mother Teresa, the late Mo Saint Mother Teresa, said to us and said to me personally on Parliament Hill a number of years ago, the beautiful thing about the pro-life movement is that it's ordinary people doing extraordinary things for God. Thanks for coming to this uh, virtual March for Life. It's something a little different, and we've worked very hard, just as hard as we did with the, the, the march where we were physically present in Ottawa, but uh, we worked just as hard on this one, so I hope you uh, enjoy and participate. Thank you. God bless. All right, before we cut to those greeting messages, Josie actually introduced uh, our co-chair, Margie Mountain, as the youth committee chair. And I just want to say this to you, Margie, and I know you're watching, you are always welcome to be part of the youth committee. Um, as Jim mentioned, this National March for Life is dedicated to the one and only Father Alphonse de Volk. And we had a mass, a memorial mass for him yesterday. If you missed that, you can still watch it on the March for Life Canada YouTube channel. And I just want to say a quick story about Father Alphonse Volk. He used to work in the Campaign Life Coalition office for, for many, many years. And when I first started there 10 years ago, he was there. And I will never forget his noon call to, to, to prayer. Every day at 11.50 a.m., we would hear on the page, it's 10 minutes to 12, time to pray. And everyone dropped what they're doing, and we all gathered in the front, in the foyer of the office to pray. We continue that tradition every single day. And even now, when we're all working from home on lockdown, we still join into our conference calls at noon every day to pray for everyone in the movement, to pray to God to help us with our work, and just to pray for an end to abortion. We never expected that we'd have to turn to a virtual National March for Life, but we're really glad that we did. We're really glad that you're participating. The reason why we have this march is because Exactly 51 years ago, on May 14, 1969, an omnibus bill passed which decriminalized abortion. Since then, over 4 million children have been killed because of this travesty. 
And so even though you're going to have, hear a lot of exciting speakers today, even though you're going to be informed about these issues, it is important to remember that our work must continue every single day so that we can secure legal protection for all human life from conception to natural death. And of course, this whole virtual National March for Life week and today's show would not be possible if not for the generous contributions of our Rose and Platinum sponsors. So we'd like to thank the Knights of Columbus, LifeSight News, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, and the Archdiocese of Montreal for ensuring that we could even do this virtual National March for Life. And speaking of the Knights of Columbus, the Knights have always been such great supporters of the March for Life in Canada and around the world. They support marches everywhere. So I just want to now cut to some video messages that we've received from the Knights of Columbus, followed by a greeting message from some of our spiritual leaders. Great, Nicholas, I'm the Supreme Warden for the Knights of Columbus. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to address the right to life as part of this National March for Life Week in Canada. And for us, Knights of Columbus, of course, we believe strongly that life begins at the moment of conception right to its natural end. This particular winter, I had the opportunity to be at the March for Life in Washington, where Native Americans have formed an organization called uh, Life is Sacred. And our theme was uh, abortion is not the native way. There were about 350 people there, families from all over parts of the United States, and I was there from Canada. And so for us, as I said, you know, we, I'm always uh, amazed uh, by comments that uh, popes have made. And in particular, I just want to give a quote here, what Pope John Paul II said in the United States back in October 7, 1979. All human life from the moment of conception and through all subsequent stages is sacred because human life is created in the image and likeness of God. Nothing surpasses the greatness or dignity of a human person. So for me also as an indigenous person in this country, our teachings also tell us about the sacredness of life. And I was brought up in a strong Catholic family in my community. And again, it was emphasized for us how significant and important each life is because my parents had uh, 12 children, 12 whom died as infants. So she said, the rest of us who are alive, uh, we are a gift of the Creator. So this is what I want to share with you. I want to congratulate everybody for do, do using the new format and for all of those uh, participating and listening. Thank you very, very much. Dear friends, my name is David Peters and I am the State Deputy of the Ontario Knights of Columbus. The Knights of Columbus is a large Catholic fraternal organization and proud supporters of the March for Life and its admirable pro-life efforts. The Knights of Columbus in Ontario have been and will continue to be regular supporters and participants in the National March for Life held in Ottawa each year. Though there will be no physical march this year, the need to support our families from conception to natural death is more important than ever. The virtual National March for Life provides an opportunity for every Knights of Columbus Council member and their families to participate and learn about the challenges related to the sanctity of human life in Canada. Therefore, on behalf of almost 56,000 Ontario Knights of Columbus members, I encourage you to pray fervently for an end to abortion in the hope that all of mankind will realize that every life is precious and worth saving. Please go to the Ontario State Council Knights of Columbus website and view the March for Life banner where you will find a link to all the activities for this week. In closing, I would like to quote Jeremiah 1 verse 8 which says, Be not afraid for I am with you. My family and I are not afraid to stand up in respect for life. We ask that you please continue to stand with us. May God bless the pro-life movement and the efforts of its membership who are willing to protect the most vulnerable in our society. Thank you for being the voice of the voiceless in this dark silence. 
Hello, I'm uh, Charlie Masters, Bishop of the Anglican Network of Canada, and uh, though I'm sorry we don't get to actually march in Ottawa this May, I'm delighted that Campaign Life is working on a plan for a virtual March for Life, which is so important. For years we have marched with Anglicans for Life Canada and many Anglicans, not just in Ottawa, but across the country. We love it that though the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. We're also grateful, and in fact, we're at home now because we are trying to protect life. Um, and so it seems so important in these days to be standing for life and to promote life. God bless you. I'm Cardinal Collins, the Archbishop of Toronto. And I ask everyone to join in prayer, praying the Lord God to bless and protect all of those amongst us, especially those who are most vulnerable, to protect the unborn, to protect those near the end of life who are facing the increasing danger of euthanasia, which is growing within our country. May the Lord bless and guide all of those who are vulnerable. This is something we think about more and more in these days of pandemic when we recognize, faced with the realities of life and death, that each one of us lives a precious life in this world until we come before the Heavenly Father. And we're called to reach out in the midst of these struggles, to care for those who are in need, to do so with love and with compassion. And that is something which we engaged in the pro-life movement have been doing for such a long time, to care for everyone from the first moment of conception to natural death. This is our prayer. This is why we need to be not afraid in the midst of the struggles we face in these days and which we have faced over such a long time. May the Lord bless and keep and guide all who are engaged in this great work as advocates for life. Once again, thank you to all the spiritual leaders for their support of, their, of the March for Life, especially to those who contributed prayer services or masses this morning with the explicit intention of restoring a culture of life. We cannot fight this battle without you. We cannot do this alone, so thank you. And the theme of this year's March for Life is Be Not Afraid. And who better to talk about that theme than our first guest, of this virtual rally. So earlier this week, I had a chance to talk to Canada's pro-life prisoner of conscience, Mary Wagner, about the theme and about the work, not the work, but about the vocation and the calling she is doing. Here it is. The theme for this year's March is Be Not Afraid. Uh, you know, amazing words that are found in the gospel, but also words that I think uh, one of both you and mine, one of our biggest heroes in the world, John Paul II, St. John Paul II, often, often talked about during his papacy. Um, why are those words so important in today's world? They are so important because um, they speak not only um, on the level of our of revealed faith, but really to the heart of our conscience. Um, I watched a beautiful film, I don't know if you saw it, but called The Hidden Life and um, featuring, uh, um, ha I forget, Franz Jagerstetter, I think is his, his name. And he, um, if we know the this, this story, um, he was uh, a simple, hu humble father, father and farmer. And he was a Catholic, a devout Catholic during the um, occupation of the Nazis in Austria. And he um, simply um, stood his ground because he knew that he couldn't do something that he knew was wrong. And so the words be not afraid, I think they resonate deep in our conscience whenever we are faced with a choice um, to, to either, I mean, not just to do right or wrong, but to, to choose even the, the better, the, the better path. And um, that transcends all, all, all faith even, but um, especially as Christians, they resonate for us because, um, because they come from the words of Jesus. You've been I mean, you've been on the front lines, uh, you've been helping these women, and you have saved lives. Um, what is, you know, what, what, what drives you, what keeps you going, uh, what gives you that courage uh, to continue reaching out to these women in that, you know, in that final hour before 
where they are faced with that decision. Do I go through with this procedure or do I walk away? It's really prayer, Matthew. Um, it's really prayer. And I, I'm grateful. And I don't think that God would have led me to this if I, he hadn't prepared me um, through um, time in the monastery and um, understanding the preeminence of prayer, of adoration, especially not just, I mean, there's so many different ways that we can pray, but really um, seeking seeking God, seeking his will, seeking what pleases him, and um, continuing to return to prayer. Every every year um, since I moved to Toronto in 2010, I, I've been able to take a time after a period in custody and give it all to God and, and really um, ask him, shall I continue this path? And so really surrendering to him, asking his will um, has been what gives me that confidence because um, I think that... Um, if we know what what his will is, what's ple most pleasing to him, then he gives us that grace to carry it out and and that confidence. Um, as for reaching out to those women at that moment, I Saint Therese has really been um, an invaluable friend to me, and um, the little way of love that God is not asking us to do great things, but to be faithful. And so, in in reaching um, a woman who is at that moment determined to abort her child. Um, it's really asking God to come in and step in and just trusting and asking him to to lead um, step by step, little by little, and putting it all in his hands. A lot of people uh, know you as Mary Wagner, who goes, walks into these abortion facilities and tries to help these women choose life. But what some people don't realize and don't maybe know is that once you do get uh, convicted of these crimes, um, you go to prison. And in prison, your ministry does not end in jail. Because uh -huh. there are a lot of women in prison who are also pregnant, who are in a crisis. Can you tell us a story maybe about an experience you had behind bars, so to say, so to speak, yeah. uh, where you're able to really bring Christ's love to some of these women who are, who are truly suffering in prison? Okay. Um... Well, and maybe I'll share um, a story about one of these women that you mentioned that we've met who is pregnant and abortion minded. Um, Linda Gibbons, who has spent many, uh, probably 11 years, I think, in custody um, and is the reason why I moved to Toronto 10 years ago. Um, she and I happened to be in maximum security together in the summer fall of 2012. And um, we had just um, learned that one of the women we had been with had aborted at probably five and a half months or so she'd come from another jail to abort in Toronto and just grieving that the loss of that little one we met a, another woman who had just come in and she was pregnant and also abortion minded having had um, her, her, several of her children aborted and not not having any um, living children we Linda um, and I we prayed and we fasted for this woman and we also got help on the outside for her it was um, a bit of a finan financial uh, component to her her struggle and um, some people who were willing to help her out on the outside and but really I have a very strong sense that it was um, the week of prayer and fast fasting that we offered for her and um, this mom came to see me her little boy was born on Mother's Day um, and then she came to see me when he was about four months old and they were just thriving she was a completely different person. He had changed her life completely uh, for the better. And um, so I really believe that that's the power of prayer. And um, also, um, it makes me think of the story in the gospel when the friends of the man who was paralyzed brought him over to Jesus on a mat. And it was um, the, the remark of Jesus that when he saw their faith, um, he he healed the man. He said, "Your sins are forgiven," and he healed the man. And that um, that the the intention of God to unite us and the power therein of a united family um, of of believers. It was an absolute privilege to talk to Mary Wagner. I mean, Mary has lived through so much and I'm just so inspired by how calm and at peace she is in her ministry and how much love she radiates uh, to everyone she meets. And Josie, I know that for a long time before you got involved in Campaign Life Coalition, 
Mary was one of your personal heroes. Yes, absolutely. How can she not be that she sacrifices so much and she does it with so much love as well? Yeah, exactly. So we, we pray for Mary and her family. And uh, I just want to say that the extended interviews we will be posting on March for Life Canada's YouTube page in the coming weeks. Uh, but for now, make sure to uh, tweet at us, follow us, Facebook us, uh, send us your pictures, what you're doing today. Are you in your home alone or with your family? Put on your pro-life t-shirt, grab a pro-life sign, make one, write one up, take a photo and send it to our Twitter account at Campaign Life or post it or share it or tag us on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Campaign Life Coalition. And of course, in order to get to our goal of protecting pre-born children so that Mary Wagner doesn't have to go to jail for trying to save babies, is electing pro-life MPs. So it's a real privilege always to be able to hear from our pro-life elected representatives. And we have a handful of them today in a montage that you're going to be seeing very soon. If one of those MPs happen to be yours, then please let us know in the chat. You're very lucky. Also write them a note of thanks for supporting the march. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Arnold Viersen, and I'm the Member of Parliament for Peace River Westlock. I'm extremely grateful to join you today on this virtual March for Life. I want to take the time to remind each and every one of you to advocate for the rights of the preborn. 300 babies are aborted from Canada every day. That's 15 classrooms full. And these children are missing, missing from our playgrounds, missing from our classrooms, missing from their mother's arms, and missing out on discovering our world. Who knows, maybe one of these 100,000 babies that are missing every year could have found the cure for cancer. During this time of COVID, I'm grateful that Justin Trudeau and his government understand the value of life and how important it is to take measures to protect it. The government will sacrifice the economy to protect vulnerable Canadians, and all of us are practicing social distancing to protect the vulnerable. But what about the preborn? Preborn Canadians are arguably some of the most vulnerable Canadians. One in four preborn Canadians are killed before they are born, for a total of 100,000 per year, or 300 a day. Who will speak for the preborn? These days, with COVID-19, there's a lot of talk about models and flattening the curve. Well, when it comes to abortion and the, of the preborn in this country, we don't need a model. We know that it's about 300 a day. Not a model, not a guess. Those are the reported numbers that the taxpayer is paying for. And so I ask again, who will speak for the preborn? Well, you will, and I will. And, we, and if we can social distance and sacrifice the economy for the sake of vulnerable Canadians, then you and I can raise our voices on behalf of preborn Canadians. We are making a difference. We are winning the argument. There are more pro-life MPs than ever before. If we work together, we will be able to protect the preborn. Thank you. God bless you all. God keep our land glorious and free. Hi everyone, it's a real privilege uh, for me to be with you today and I want to thank Campaign Life Coalition for their great work in making this event come together. I want to thank all of you for everything that you do in the midst of all the other responsibilities that you have with your daily life to make a difference on behalf of the unborn. We are His hands, His feet. God has chosen to use us to make a difference on this earth and I am honored to be part of that with you. For me as a member of parliament, I am so excited to be able to be presenting a bill that reflects the majority of Canadians in regards to abortion, specifically in regards to sex selection abortion. Canadians know that this is wrong and they have indicated that they feel that it should be illegal. So we are making a difference by reaching out to everyone across our country who agrees on this issue. Thank you again for what you're doing. Please don't give up. Please don't lose hope. Continue to do the good that God has called us to do. We leave the rest in his hands. I pray for you, and I pray that you will continue to reach out and encourage and support and pray for the members of Parliament on the Hill who support pro-life initiatives. Thank you so much. God bless. Hi, my name is Derek Sloan, Member of Parliament for Hastings, Lennox and Addington in Eastern Ontario. I wanted to greet all of you involved in the March for Life this year. I'm a pro-life candidate in the Conservative Party leadership race. I've already pledged to allow a full discussion on any and all aspects of abortion in Parliament 
if I am elected as leader, there will be debates, there will be discussions, there will be votes on all aspects and issues surrounding abortion. You're doing the right thing to march today for life. You're doing the right thing to stand up for those who are unable to stand up for themselves. I encourage you to get involved in this leadership race, to learn more about me, and to learn more about other candidates who are pro-life as well. My website is www.dericksloan.ca. I look forward to connecting with you in the future. God bless you for what you're doing. Have a great day. I'm Garnet Jenis, Member of Parliament for Sherwood Park Fort Saskatchewan and Conservative Shadow Minister for Multiculturalism. In my role involving multiculturalism, I have an opportunity to see the vast breadth of our country in terms of its intellectual, religious, cultural uh, diversity. And all that diversity is built on a foundation of freedom. Uh, the fact that we're able to have differences of opinion on complex issues and that we're able to live out uh, our, our deeply held convictions and respect each other in the midst of that. Uh, but we see threats to freedom of conscience and religion in Canada today. We see efforts by some governments to limit government funding to groups that don't share their ideology on certain things. We see efforts to limit the ability of people to wear uh, religious symbols. Uh, we see efforts to constrain the ability of, of doctors, of lawyers, uh, to be practicing if they don't uh, either practice in a certain way or sign on to certain covenants. And it's important that we recognize the foundational importance of freedom of conscience and religion, uh, and members of Parliament need to stand up for those principles. Hello, March for Life. It's Rosemary Falk, Member of Parliament for Battleford Lloydminster here in Saskatchewan. Thank you to each of you for your commitment to the sanctity of life. From conception to natural death, and every minute in between, life has value. I encourage you to keep the faith and to stand firm in your convictions. Together, we can shift culture and change the narrative. Thank you, and God bless. Hi, I'm Michael Barrett, Member of Parliament for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. During this pandemic, we've been asked to make sacrifices in our daily lives for the most vulnerable among us. We affirm the inherent human dignity in all Canadians, a dignity that cannot be shaken regardless of age, location, color, or creed. The dignity of the human person must be the foundational block of a truly right and just society. And I ask you to stand with us in support of the right to life for every Canadian, from conception to natural death. Hi, I'm Ted Falk, Member of Parliament for Provence. March for Life looks a little different this year, but I'm glad that we're still able to connect. COVID-19 has claimed the lives of more than a thousand Canadians. This is a tragedy, and my heart and prayers go out to those who are sick and to those who have lost loved ones. The premature loss of any life is a tragedy, let alone a thousand. Yet in any given year, some 100,000 Canadian lives are ended prematurely in the womb. Their deaths are not the result of dreaded disease, but of the unwillingness of Canada's leaders to protect the rights of unborn Canadians. Hi there, I'm Tamara Jansen, Member of Parliament for Cloverdale Langley City, and I'm so honoured to be part of this initiative to celebrate life at all stages. Now, during the recent pandemic, we've seen how much Canadians truly value our seniors and those most vulnerable in our communities. Well, we need to keep going, and we need to ensure that our country has a robust palliative care system in place so that all Canadians can live with dignity till their natural death. We can do this. Together, we can champion the rights of all Canadians at all stages of life. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Block and I'm a member of Parliament from Saskatchewan. Every year, rain or shine, and now, through a pandemic, the March for Life continues. It continues because we all care deeply about the value and dignity of each human life, from conception to natural death. I am immensely honoured to send my greetings to this historic, first-ever, virtual March for Life. Greetings, pro-lifers. On behalf of the Christian Heritage Party, I want to thank every pro-life MP, Senator, and MLA for standing up for life. I want to thank every pro-life member of a municipal council or local school board, every pro-life doctor, nurse, teacher, lawyer, pastor, and priest for standing up for life. I want to thank all you pro-life young people for standing up for life. And I want to thank every pro-life parent who has faithfully taught your children to respect and value the dignity and sanctity of every human life. 
Abortion and euthanasia are issues of the heart, and Canada is a nation of laws. If we want to protect innocent human life from conception until natural death, we're going to have to change both hearts and laws. Political action must be accompanied by prayer and by patiently educating our friends, neighbors, and co-workers on the infinite value of every human life. We stand with you in this sacred task. God bless you all. So with us right now is one of the MPs from that montage, MP Kathy Wagenthal from Yorkton, Melville, Saskatchewan. Kathy, it's great that you could join us today. Glad to be here. It's our it's pleasure, our to, have pleasure to have you. Now, Kathy, now, Kathy on, on February 26th, you February introduced 26th. Bill C-233, which would prohibit sex-selective abortions. Essentially, any physician who knowingly carries out an abortion for the sole reason of sex would be penalized. So, Kathy, there are a lot of different um, pro-life pieces of legislation that you could put forward. Why this bill? Sure, thanks for that question. Actually, uh, as I was anticipating what I would do, there was a poll, uh, a dark maroon blue poll that came out in the National Post specifically on the issue of abortion with very direct questions with an answer of just, should this be legal or illegal? And in there, 84% uh, of Canadians said that when it came to an abortion solely for the purpose of choosing the sex of the child, 84% of Canadians said that this should be illegal. So uh, in the environment we're in right now where our country is so divided and there's so much divisiveness, this I felt uh, was an opportunity for us to work together across the whole nation on an issue that clearly the majority of Canadians agree with. So it was an opportunity I felt to, to show what the article also said is that we are not as uh, polarized in this country as perhaps the media and a lot of politicians would like you to think. You're right. You're this right. should be this an easy bill to pass. Bill to pass. Um, except that there might be some people who argue that, you know, this is a problem in Asia. This is not a problem in Canada. So this bill is unnecessary. What would you have to say in response to those people? Sure. And I do get those questions. First of all, the majority of Canadians still are appalled when they learn that there are no laws in Canada. We're the only uh, democratic country in the world that has no regulations around abortion, no laws. Uh, us in North Korea, and that's not good company. So I'm able to tell them that actually there's been research done in the last three, four years, specifically in this regard. And the Canadian Medical Association has come out saying, actually, this is a growing problem in Canada and that it needs to be addressed. So there's a lot of information out there that actually does show this is happening in our country and it does shock people when they learn that that is the case. Yeah, it is, it is crazy. Um, and obviously um, those concerns that this bill is not unnecessary, um, it, it, are, are, they have no grounding. So um, you also introduced um, Cassie and Molly's law a few years ago, and that would have afforded legal protection for unborn victims of crime. Um, also a bill that should have had popular support, but sadly didn't pass. So Kathy, why is it important that we continue to persevere in trying to pass pro-life pieces of legislation, even though we continuously face these obstacles? Right. Well, there's no question that you have to persevere and, and we all have to persevere wherever God has put us in this plan. And within the House of Commons, it's true, uh, various parties whipped their votes on an issue of conscience, which should not be the case in our country. And, and the advantage I have with this particular bill is that, uh, you know, our government touts that they are all about um, equality, equality between men and women boys and girls. And so that's the premise of this. If, if you are truly about equality and not discrimination uh, against young uh, babies in the womb that are girls, then you have to support this. And Canadians are calling on us to support it. So we have to find these areas where we have an opportunity to truly reflect Canadian values and move from there. And anything worth fighting for is worth fighting for continually. And so this is something that we can do uh, as pro-lifers. But the reality is the majority of Canadians right now uh, want abortion as an option, but they are absolutely against abortion uh, for the purpose of choosing the sex of their child. So this is an opportunity for us to work together and I will continue to fight 
on your behalf and, and on the behalf of the unborn children that are implicated in this. Thank you so much for that, Kathy. And I really look forward to the debate on this bill. I really look forward to our feminist prime minister trying to defend his position on his support for sex selective abortion, which is bizarre. And so I would encourage all those watching to uh, visit Campaign Life Coalition's website to sign our petition in support of your bill. And then more importantly, to contact your MP, be it calling them or emailing them, et cetera, and point out that, you know what, that this bill does have popular support. It shouldn't be controversial. We, we should be able to say that this type of abortion is abhorrent at the very least. And so once again, Kathy, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for uh, introducing this bill in the first place and please keep up the good fight. Thank you so much, same to you. Thank you, Kathy. And now we have highlights from our 2018 March for Life. Please enjoy. 2018 National March for Life. Let's march! <laughs> Campaign Life Coalition, the organizers of this amazing event, which is also the largest pro-life demonstration in Canada. Campaign Life has been organizing the march for 21 years, and this year marks their 40th year of their commitment to restoring the culture of life in Canada. We have a right to a place at the democratic table, and that is what we're exercising here on Parliament Hill. I regret my abortion and feel called to share my story of hurt and healing. And that is why I am silent no more. Thank you. I thought I would be doing my child a great service by giving them a death sentence they did not ask for. But God made something out of nothing. When I chose life, my life began. We are pro life. We vote. Pro Canadians are pro life. All right. Are you thankful for the gift of life today? I believe that the very most fundamental human right that any government can give to its people is the right to life. It is time for Canada to, at the very least, come into line with every other democracy in the world and extend legal protection to preborn children. Raise your voices and stand with me and use your voice so we together can make Ontario and make Canada this great nation, the place it should be, where we have human rights and free speech for all. Thank you very much. 35 years later, Mary met her birth son, Patrick, who is now a member of our family. Give it up for Patrick, Malin, and my dear wife for choosing life. When it comes to Canada, I am here with you. I am pro-life all in. I am so proud to be here with you today. Thank you. No compromises on the lives of the unborn, no exceptions, we added no excuses, no apologies. So every single human being created by Almighty God in his own image and likeness is worthy of our support and defense. We will meet this challenge. It is us youth, those here today and those that will join us. Protect life from the moment it begins. Thank you so much. One of, the truly, one of the things I truly love about watching these highlight reels is that it never gets old. Like literally seeing thousands and thousands of people march in par on, on Parliament Hill and through the streets of Ottawa is just, um, you know what, it's a motivator that next year we will be back in Ottawa, hopefully. <laughs> but we will be back in numbers, in large numbers, with, uh, with everyone from across the country. And the beautiful thing about the March for Life in Canada is that it truly is a national, national movement. There are marches for life all across the country every year. There are some amazing people who work throughout the year to organize these events in their regional or in their provincial capitals. 
And uh, with us today, we created, uh, we will show you uh, a wonderful montage that we've created uh, thanks to the videos that were submitted to us by the various leaders of the marches from coast to coast to coast. Roll the clips. My name is Pauline. I'm with the Whitehorse Right to Life group, and I'm speaking to you from Whitehorse Yukon, home of the most northern pro-life walk for life in Canada. Our daylight hours are getting longer and longer, with sunrises around 5.45 a.m. and sunsets as late as 10 p.m. at this point. The crocuses are coming out, the trumpeter swans are flying overhead, and the ice on the Yukon River is melting. Spring is definitely on its way. The Yukon as a territory has about 42,000 people. We have three hospitals, one larger one in the capital of Whitehorse, and two in rural communities, plus several health clinics. Unfortunately, as far as we are aware, Abortions up to 14 weeks, as well as assisted suicide, or MAID, are still happening at the Whitehorse Hospital during this coronavirus health crisis. We haven't heard otherwise. And it's very difficult to find good stats on abortion here. The Mifigemiso pill prescriptions and MAID, we also can't find data on easily. Data from the Canadian Health Institute for Health Information states that there were 86 induced abortions in the Yukon in 2018. That's down from a high of about 150 in 2010. But we're not sure if this number includes the women that are flown down to Vancouver on tax dollars for medical abortion when they are past 14 weeks of pregnancy. And of course, with the availability of the Mifigemiso pill, which is 100% funded by the Yukon government, we will probably see the number of hospital abortions continue to drop. We are definitely saddened and dismayed that the taking of human life continues to happen here during this global crisis where so much is being done to keep others alive. Every year, we organize our annual silent walk for life in solidarity with those who cannot speak for themselves. This usually happens on the same day as the Ottawa National March for Life in May. Unfortunately, this year, that won't be happening, but we're grateful to join all of you for this virtual event. Thanks for the invite, and as this year's theme says, be not afraid. Hello from British Columbia. My name is Levi Minderhoud and I am one of the organizing members for the BC March for Life. British Columbia has claimed that it's protecting life in its efforts to combat COVID-19. But unfortunately, life is not protected and valued at all stages in our province. Although elective surgeries have been canceled throughout our province during COVID, abortions still happen because our province deems abortions to be an essential service. Our province also is requiring local hospices, like the Delta Hospice, to provide euthanasia, even though euthanasia violates the conscience of staff members, of the membership of the hospice, and even the philosophy of hospice care itself. British Columbians cannot stand idly by and watch this tragedy unfold. We need to protect life, and that's why, even though the BC March for Life has to be canceled due to COVID. We are joining the National March for Life. We need to tell our society, our governments, our neighbors that life is in need of protection. Our theme for the BC March for Life was going to be 2020 Vision for Life. And we hope and pray that all of you can help us share that vision. God bless. Hello. I'm Jeremy Wimpson, co-founder of the Concerned Parents of SD76. While here in Medicine Hat, Alberta, babies are safe from the horrors of abortion. That is not the case in most of the province. And with the previous NDP government's legislation on bubble zones, that work just got a lot harder. That hasn't stopped pro-life groups and legislatures from fighting back though. Just last fall, a brave MLA, Dan Williams, dared to table a conscience rights bill to protect doctors like those in Medicine Hat from being forced to perform abortions. And though that bill died when legislature was prorogued, I know it is going to come back. You can count on it. And we are going to keep fighting the fight until the job is done. So keep up the march for life. After all, isn't the preservation of life the reason we are all still in lockdown? Hi, I'm Celeste. I'm the office manager for the Saskatchewan Pro-Life Association. Here at Sask Pro-Life, we work to organize and mobilize the pro-life people of Saskatchewan for one strong, united pro-life voice. Every year, along with CLC Saskatchewan, the Knights of Columbus, and the Regina Pro-Life Group, 
we organize the Provincial March for Life, which happens here in Regina. Every year, Sask for Life also takes a youth group to Ottawa for the National March. Here, the youth have the opportunity to meet with pro-life MPs, they partake in youth events, prayer events, and of course they get to march with thousands of pro-life comrades from across the country in the National March. These events and experiences always deeply move the youth and encourage them to be more active in their own communities. This is such a fantastic opportunity, so of course we were disappointed when we found out that this wasn't going to be possible in 2020. Both our Provincial March and the National March had to be cancelled. Even though we're disappointed, we also know that these cancellations won't stop pro-lifers. One very good example we have is right here in Saskatchewan. In mid-April, we found out that a Catholic hospital in Saskatoon was being pressured to open up a room for euthanasia. Right away, we emailed our members, asking them to stand up against the pressure and to encourage the hospital not to give in. Saskatchewan pro-lifers stepped up to the challenge, and they immediately started calling their MLAs, contacting the Minister of Health, the hospital, and even the media outlet, which had reported on the issue. We might not be able to march together, but pro-lifers are still finding ways to unite and stand strong for the vulnerable, and it's so encouraging to see. So thank you. Hello, my name is Maria Sleikerman, and I'm the president of Campaign Life Coalition Manitoba. I am honored to be able to bring greetings from Friendly Manitoba. As a provincial chapter, we were encouraged to adopt our first March for Life in 1999. Countless participants are young people and we are proud of them. All the, after all, they are the future. They are confident and willing to stand up for life. Let's keep working and praying that the Almighty God will soon bring legal protection for the unborn and the vulnerable. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mary Ellen Douglas, Ontario President of Campaign Life Coalition. Our Ontario leaders and contacts across the province annually fill buses from their area and take their people to Ottawa for the annual March for Life, except for this year because of the virus. Instead, they will be encouraging people to participate through this virtual March for Life with prayer followed up by action. We believe that life has to be protected from the moment of conception until natural death. And this is what we give our time and our energy, our prayers for. And we hope that we can accomplish this soon. God bless you. Bonjour tout le monde. Ici Georges Bouchemi de Campagne Québec Vie. On est à l'île Perrault, au Québec, et on vous souhaite tous et toutes une excellente marche pour la vie 2020 virtuelle. Bye! Bye. 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 Hello from New Brunswick. My name is Peter Ryan. I've been involved in pro-life a long time. Former executive director of the New Brunswick Right to Life Association. In Fredericton, we have a building where thousands of babies have lost their lives to abortion through the years. Henry Morgenthaler used to own and operate the place. Since 2015, a different owner has continued abortions at that location. The only good thing about it is that it's the only abortion clinic in all of Canada that receives not a nickel of public funding. We sure want to keep it that way. In recent months, there's been a pressure campaign to change New Brunswick's policy. Pro-lifers have pushed back, and thankfully our provincial government has resisted the pressure. But we not only want the current policy of not funding private clinics to be continued, we need that particular place to close down operations and for good. There is some hope in that regard. The building is currently for sale. Let us hope and pray that the bloodshed at that location will finally come to an end. Pro-life is alive in New Brunswick, right next door to the abortion clinic the New Brunswick Right to Life has its provincial headquarters and operates a women's care center where women can receive the help they need during pregnancy. We usually have a March for Life at this time of year, but not this year due to the pandemic. We wish everybody at the National March the very best. God bless you in all your pro-life activities. Hang in there and be not afraid. 
My name is Ruth Robert, and I am the coordinator for Campaign Life Nova Scotia. This last year in Nova Scotia, we revived the Fall 40 Days for Life campaign held outside of the Victoria General Hospital, where abortions are committed at what is called the Women's Choice Clinic. I led the campaign myself and was able to organize approximately 100 volunteers to pray outside the hospital from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. for the full 40-day period. Midway through this campaign, we also held a life chain which boasted exactly 100 pro-life volunteers. There were some counter-protesters, but we outnumbered them approximately 20 to 1. This goes to show that pro-life sentiment is strong in Nova Scotia. We are not the only ones who have noticed this, however, and our efforts seem to have been effective enough that abortion supporters petitioned the Nova Scotia legislature to pass what we consider to be unconstitutional laws regarding bubble zones. These laws came into effect in early March, and now we can no longer pray or demonstrate out within 50 meters outside the property line of the hospital. However, we will not be silenced, and we continue to demonstrate and educate outside of these boundaries. Hi, I'm Anne Marie Tomlins, bringing you greetings from the province of Prince Edward Island. Here in Prince Edward Island, um, everything's closed down for COVID. We're isolated at home. We can't go to church. We can't have um, surgery or procedures for cancer, but you can get an abortion here in Prince Edward Island at this time because it's considered an essential service. This province was once considered the life sanctuary, the only province in Canada where abortions were not taking place. And here, now we're faced with this situation. We can't march this year, but I want all of you across this country to know that even though we're not going to be publicly seen marching through the streets of Charlottetown and in front of Province House this year, we're still here. We're not going away. And we will be back in full force to continue to stand for what matters, to stand for life. Thank you. God bless everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Margaret Hines. I'm the Provincial President of Campaign Life with Newfoundland Labrador. And I bring greetings from our province. I'm in Marystown, Newfoundland, and right now I'm in our prayer garden, our beautiful prayer garden. And I pray that God gives us perfect vision this year, the grace to know what to do and the courage to carry it out to make our country once more a place that cherishes life from the unborn to the handicapped and the sick and the elderly. God bless. And this is exactly why the March for Life matters, because we're all able to come together. Even if we aren't able to make the journey to Ottawa, it is still a show of unity and a very important one. For many, the March for Life is the first time, similar to Life Chain, that they got involved in pro-life activism or a pro-life event or something like that. And again, you can participate in the March for Life as well by showing us your, your pictures of you viewing the march at home. Please tweet at Campaign Life. And then this unity is also important because we face similar problems. Ruth Robert from Nova Scotia was mentioning the bubble zone in her province. But this severe restriction on free speech is also something that British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, and Newfoundland has had to deal with as well. Here in Ontario, Father Tony Van He, a longtime pro-life activist, was arrested for violating the Ottawa bubble zone. But he wasn't even holding a sign that mentioned abortion. He was holding a sign that talked about free speech. And so Father Tony Van He was very kind to send in a reflection for the March for Life. Being a man of few words, he actually quoted uh, Cardinal Caffara from the Rome Life Forum. And I'd like to um, read this quotation. Quote, Within the confrontation between creation and anti-creation, we are called upon to testify. This testimony is our mode of being in the world. Testimony means to say, to speak to announce openly and publicly. Someone who does not testify in this way is like a soldier who flees at the decisive moment in battle. We are no longer witnesses but deserters if we do not speak openly and publicly. The March for Life is therefore a great testimony." Unquote. And so of course we agree with the sentiment and God bless Father Tony Van He for his personal witness. 
Additionally, we've set up a crowdfunding page for him. You can go to wonderwe.com slash helpfather, just F-R Van He. So Matt, um, can you uh, talk to us about Steve Carlin, who you were able to interview? Yes, definitely. Steve, just like uh, Father Tony, is one of the many, many pro-life activists uh, who testify to life on a daily, daily basis. Steve Carlin is the campaign director for 40 Days for Life campaign. 40 Days for Life is one of those amazing campaigns that just brings so many people together. And over the past 15 years, it has saved thousands of lives. It has closed down abortuaries and abortion facilities. It has uh, facilitated many abortion workers to leave that grisly business. So earlier this week, I had a chance to sit down with uh, Steve Carlin and we chatted about Bubble Zones, the 40 Days for Life uh, campaign in Canada, and much more. Here's how it went. I came to Canada about, uh, I think, 10, 15 years ago now, and it's really blossomed. And there are multiple cities that run campaigns all across the country. Um, not as many as there are in the States, obviously, but I feel like we're, we're uh, pulling our weight. Absolutely. There are, have really been remarkable developments at Canadian 40 Days for Life campaigns. I, I know you've been working with Ruth Robert in Nova Scotia, and she's really kind of commanded the attention of the entire province. The, the provincial parliament has cracked down on her by implementing yet another bubble zone, which I know in many ways is a discouragement for Canadian pro-lifers, but at the same time, it should be a bit of an encouragement because let's face it, the civil authorities, they don't waste their time on things like bubble zones unless the power of prayer is made evident, unless it's having a, a toll on the bottom line of the number of abortions that are taking place. So uh, I, I know that's bad news in a way, but at the same time, I think it's good news too. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, with the bubble zones, it has uh, become an obstacle for those people who do engage and participate in 40 Days for Life campaigns uh, because, you know, we have, there's a certain amount of, uh, we, we have to stand within fit or outside 50 meters, for example, or even up to 200 meters in some cases uh, outside of private abortion facilities. But I feel like pro-lifers, we're, we're a creative bunch and we don't get discouraged that easily. So even with these totalitarian bubble zone laws in Ontario, in Nova Scotia, in British Columbia and Alberta now. Um, I feel like pro-lifers continue to take on the 40 Days for Life campaign and, and they continue to save lives. Yeah, 40 Days for Life is a movement that is grounded in prayer. So I know is the, the March for Life and Campaign Life Coalition. And what I think we all have to recognize, even as we get frustrated by these things, is that God is bigger and more powerful than any bubble zone legislation. And this is not something that's limited to Canada. Countries all around the world have implemented bubble zones in response to 40 Days for Life, and they still continue to save babies. It might not be as easy. They might not always find out with that immediate confirmation of the mother leaving you know, that conversation that confirms it. But at the same time, we know and we've gotten reports of moms who have chosen life. Sometimes it takes a year or two or more for them to come back and say, hey, thanks for being here. Uh, you weren't able to talk with me at the time, but because you were here, I chose life. And wouldn't you like to meet my daughter in the backseat of my car? Happens all the time. So we know that God is bigger. And our Lord tells us, blessed are those who have not seen but have believed and i think that's what the bubble zone does it forces us to believe without seeing to put our money where our mouth is when it comes to our trust in god for sure and even even this past uh, i guess it was the spring campaign due to the the health crisis pandemic and the lockdown all across the world really uh, the campaign had to i guess abandon its uh, vigils its physical vigils outside of uh, abortion facilities and hospitals but the prayer and the fasting continued and you yeah. still saw the fruits of that. After 26 days, we canceled the public vigils. And like you said, we continued with the prayer and fasting and the community outreach. And, and we did continue to see results because we had an example, great example, Manhattan, New York, the really for the U.S., the epicenter of the coronavirus epidemic and the, the epicenter of the abortion crisis here in the States. Uh, we had a... Uh, you know, folks going out and they could no longer stand vigil, but they would decide to go take their walk, get their daily exercise by walking by the abortion facility. And even then somebody came out of the abortion facility and said, Hey, I was here. I was going to have an abortion, but I I'm not going to do it. Like what kind of stranger goes up and just brings that up to somebody taking a walk? It doesn't happen except through the providence of God. So we know that there were others who were saved too. And uh, it was unfortunate that we had to stop the public vigils, but we're definitely going to be back out in full force this fall, September 23rd to November 1st for our fall 40 Days for Life campaign.
That's right. And uh, the applications are opening up soon, I hear, right? Yes, we'll begin accepting applications to lead a local 40 Days for Life campaign, 40 Days for Life of Prayer, Fasting, Community Outreach, and Peaceful Vigil uh, on June 1st. So check out our website, 40daysforlife.com. You can bring this life-saving effort to your community, bubble zone or no bubble zone. Those prayers are going to be answered. We trust that, that the Lord answers them. He's never outdone in generosity, and no prayer is ever in vain. Not only did COVID-19 force uh, uh, 40 Days for Life campaigns to halt their uh, spring campaign, what has happened is we've seen a renewed uh, spike in uh, chemical abortions all across the world. The abortion industry has been pushing chemical abortions for many years, and we all know that chemical abortions always, well, 99% of the or 95% of the time, kill the unborn child, and they also have the potential to kill the woman who takes these two pills. And even if that pill does not kill the unborn child, they, there have been many complications which force the woman to have to still seek surgical support. Now, to talk with us about chemical abortions is Dr. Martin Owen. Dr. Martin Owen, you are the founder and CEO of Vitae Medical Solutions. Thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. It's uh, really my pleasure to join you on this uh you know, unusual, but uh, an, an unprecedented virtual March for Life. I've certainly been at a number of the live March for Lifes and have a, a deep uh, family connection uh, to the March for Life. Um, you know, my, my wife's grandfather, Adrian Keat, was a real uh, Canadian pro-life hero and really inspired me in my medical practice to protect the dignity and sanctity of human life from conception to natural death. So it's my pleasure to be with you. Well, thank you so well, thank much, you Dr. So much Dr. Dr. And I just want and to cut to the chase here. Uh, chemical abortions, as I mentioned earlier, are on a rise. In some parts of the world, almost 90% of all abortions are chemical abortions. But there is hope. I read just yesterday that the Abortion Pill Rescue Network, which helps women who have taken that first pill and now want to reverse that process to choose life, they can actually find support and we can, there are ways to actually help save the, the child's life. So I recently read that the Abortion Pill Rescue Network saw a record demand in March with 105 women seeking to halt the process of this chemical abortion. Can you explain exactly how does abortion pill reversal work? Yeah, that, yeah that's correct. So they definitely saw their, their record high in March of 105 abortion pill reversal starts. And they've also uh, achieved uh, 1,100, that's 1,100 lives saved through the Abortion Pill Rescue Network since 2012. Now, prior to 2017, the abortion uh, pill RU486 or in Canada, Mifajimizo was not available in Canada. Uh, but since it has become available, abortion pill reversal is also available in Canada. Uh, the previous chemical abortions in Canada did not uh, lend themselves to reversal. So the way reversal works is by targeting the, the way the abortion pill uh, kills the unborn baby. So it does that by starving the baby of progesterone. So in this case, uh, we're reversing the effects of the abortion by giving women uh, safe and effective progesterone. So this is a FDA approved uh, medication. It's the same hormone that supports a healthy pregnancy and we give it in sufficient amounts to outcompete uh, the blocking uh, effects of the mifepristone, which is the first medication that a woman takes in the abortion uh, pill process or in the chemical abortion process. So the good news is, is that uh, when a woman takes this, if she does have regrets, she can call uh, a 1-800 number, a hotline where we have uh, nurses standing by to triage her and connect her with physicians and other prescribers who are knowledgeable in abortion pill reversal. And we have about a 64 to 68 percent success rate of reversing the abortion process and leading to a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby. Uh, there's been no increased risk of uh, any kind of birth defects associated with progesterone. Again, it is the same hormone that is associated with a normal healthy pregnancy. So in Canada, same as in the United States or other countries, uh, women who are regretful of taking that first uh, abortion pill can call 1-877-558-0333 
24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year and connect with a nurse uh, who can help guide them to a provider who can assist them with that process. Well, thank you, doctor, for that. And, and honestly, I, I don't know. Um, there's so many, uh, there's so much information about the chemical abortions in Canada, and yet it's so hard to find this specific type of information. So just a, a, a call to action to all Canadians watching. Yeah, a call to action to all Canadians watching. And we do need more. We need more abortion pill uh, rescue providers in Canada. So if you're a physician who is looking to learn more about uh, helping women who are in this crisis situation to reverse the effects of uh, an abortion process that they regret, you can give them that option and you can help them uh, save the life of their unborn child. And as you mentioned, uh, the harmful effects of the abortion process. Uh, so if you're interested in doing that, you can just email uh, info at apr.life uh, or check out the website uh, aprnworldwide.com. Simply Google and it will take you right there. Thank you for that information, doctor. And we're going to move along to just one final question. Uh, you are one of the leading advocates of, uh, for, for the defense of conscience rights in Canada. As we all know, if you've read the news, Conscience rights are under attack in every province in the country and really all around the world. Why is conscience protection such a fundamental issue? And, you know, I always say that conscience is the foundation of ethics without the ability for anyone to, you know, assess uh, their conscience and where they stand on certain issues and then act in an ethical way according with those. then we don't really have freedom. And in the medical profession, that's just so essential when people are coming to us to get our medical judgments on issues and matters of uh, life and death and health. Uh, they really need us to be free from the pressures of laws uh, that would infringe upon our ability to make decisions that would support them in, uh, in you know, not doing harm to themselves in really seeking a wholeness and restoration of their health. And in Canada, a much more significant attack since legislation has come through for euthanasia where in some provinces ontario for instance there are policies on the books that uh, demand effective referral for all procedures and uh, and medical practices that physicians do not agree with thank you dr martin for for sharing with us this such such valuable information about chemical abortions about conscience rights uh, you can just Google Dr. Martin Owen. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff out there online and resources of, for a chemical abortion reversal and about the fight that you are leading uh, for conscience protection. Um, before we move on to the show, I'm just going to cut to a very fun and exciting highlight reel from the 2017 National March for Life. I am pro-life. I am social conservative. I am pro-freedom of speech. And I am Canadian. And these are Canadian values. And this is, this is what it means. That's why I'm here. This, this right very thing in my arms. <laughs> life is a gift. Yeah. And for 20 years, thankfully, we've had thousands of people standing together for life here in Canada. You're the largest delegation that comes to our parliament every year because you, you are right. You are standing for life. You're standing for it. You're speaking out for the children that want to live. I know the impact in my life personally with the March for Life is very personal because my mom, she had the option to not choose life because she was in an unhealthy marriage, but she chose to keep me. She chose to be a single mother and raise me by herself. So I'm so indebted to my mother's courage and bravery. And I know that I wouldn't be here without the pro-life movement. I'm thankful that my mom chose life. Thank you very much. We love those who cannot speak for themselves. So remember that. The reason you are here to celebrate life is faith, hope, love. As a young person, I represent the nation. What an incredible witness it is to stand up for life and to demonstrate how sacred it is and how much attention needs to be put towards it in this day. My mom was for life and we thank you! I am 
rights of all human beings. Uh, I've been coming to the march since I was about four years old. Yeah, and I've been here at the march for about the same amount of time, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I've been coming to the march for uh, 12 years. This is my first year. <laughs> I would love to say a big thank you to those who organized this uh, March for Light. Um, thank you so much for all the hard work you do and for getting to march for this cause. So just before that highlight reel, Dr. Martin Ohm was talking about the importance of conscience rights. And that's something that both Conservative Party leadership candidates, Derek Sloan and Leslie Lewis, have highlighted in their respective campaigns. It's been a privilege to support these candidates, especially because pro-lifers are among the most engaged voting bloc. They volunteer, they donate, and if they know a candidate will stand up for their issues, they punch above their weight in nomination meetings and elections. And so Matt, um, do you want to talk to us about why a Campaign Life Coalition, even though a nonpartisan organization, is still involved in this Conservative Party leadership race? Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, Campaign Life, many, many years ago, we were the ones who started the, the Parliamentary Pro-Life Caucus, which at that time had members from the various different parties. And over the past well, re more recently, it seems like uh, uh, both uh, the Conservative Party and the Liberal Party, well, with the Liberal Party, we all know pro-lifers need, need not apply. But with the Conservative Party, uh, there is this movement within that party to actually silence pro-life voices just as well. In other words, become a second Liberal Party. We don't want a seat at the table when it comes to these party politics. We demand a voice. And I think with this CPC leadership race, this is an opportunity for us with these two candidates to actually get a voice, win that voice, and use that voice to create change. Earlier this week, uh, CLC Political Operations Director Jack Fonseca had a chat with uh, some of these candidates, and this is how it went. Hello, Canada. My name is Jack Fonseca, Political Operations Director with Campaign Life Coalition. During our virtual National March for Life programming, we'll be interviewing both of the pro-life candidates who are officially in the Conservative Party of Canada's leadership race. And I cannot overstate the importance of this race because the next Conservative leader will most likely become your future Prime Minister. I'm pleased to introduce you to one of those leadership candidates, Dr. Leslin Lewis. Well, listen, let's jump right into it. Dr. Lewis, you own a successful law firm in Toronto, and you have an impressive academic resume with a PhD in law, a master's in environmental studies, an MBA concentration in business in, in the environment, and other academic credentials that, that I can't even remember. But to me, the most impressive thing about you is how you have run as an out and proud pro-life candidate and announced several pro-life policies in your election platform dealing with abortion. Could you please run through those policies for the, the benefit of our viewers? Sure, Jack. So I just want to start by saying that I believe in the sanctity of life, and that includes pre-born life. And life issues have divided Canadians and, and women for so long. And so I began by finding common ground and advancing policies that I believe the majority of Canadians can get behind. So the first policy that I introduced that I believe helps protect vulnerable women and girls is to ban the misogynistic practice of sex-selective abortion. And the majority of Canadians agree that it is wrong to abort a fetus on the sole purpose that it is a girl. The second policy is to seek measures to protect women from coerced abortion. And the majority of um, Canadians agree again that a woman should not be coerced into having an abortion. The third policy helps to support pregnancy care centers. And this is to make sure that women in crisis pregnancy situations have the care that they need and that they deserve. And then the fourth policy is just ending Canadian taxpayer funding of overseas foreign abortions. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lewis. Those are uh, very important incremental uh, pro-life policies that will both save lives 
and also do another thing in that they'll um, help us to uh, have the abortion issue in front of Canadians. You know, every single measure that there is that's a, an incremental pro-life measure like that um, helps us to talk about uh, pro-life issues and get people, Canadians, thinking about the right to life of preborn children. Now, uh, another sanctity of life issue on which this year's National March for Life is focusing is the topic of euthanasia and assisted suicide. So my first question to you, Dr. Lewis, is where do you stand on euthanasia? Well, Jack, I oppose euthanasia. I feel that it is very important for us to honor the life, especially of our seniors and those that are in palliative care. And they've given so much to our society. And I believe that we should give them back the love and comfort that they need in their last days. They should feel that during their last days, they're not a burden to society. And that's why under my government, I, I would invest in palliative care centers. Now, uh, another related question. Uh, Justin Trudeau's liberal government legalized this form of homicide euthanasia in 2016 under the false pretense that it would be restricted only to people who are dying. But less than four years later, here we are. The Trudeau government has introduced Bill C-7, which aims to expand the categories of killable people to those who are not even dying, but who merely have some kind of physical uh, suffering that they feel is intolerable, even if that condition is treatable or even if it's curable. Um, Bill C-7 will also expand access to death by lethal injection to those Canadians who are not physically sick whatsoever, but who merely claim um, that they're experiencing psychological suffering that's intolerable. So uh, the, 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 my next question to you is, if the Liberals succeed in passing Bill C-7, which is entirely possible given that the NDP the, uh, the, and the Bloc and, and the Green all support euthanasia quite rapidly, would you repeal it, uh, Bill C-7 if elected Prime Minister so, so as to at least claw back Canada's advance towards euthanasia on demand? Yes, I would. I would repeal Bill C-7. And more specifically, I feel that I, I disapprove of euthanasia being extended to include psychiatric patients and those struggling with mental illness. And I also vehemently oppose euthanasia being expanded to include teenagers that are suffering from mental illness. I, I'm glad you mentioned that, Dr. Lewis, the, the issue of uh, children uh, and access to euthanasia, because although that is not in Bill C-7, um, the, the Trudeau government has uh, hinted that that's where it is going to take this law eventually, that it will also expand uh, euthanasia to, to, uh, to children under the age of 18. Now, uh, Dr. Lewis, be before we close, you know, we have uh, perhaps tens of thousands of Canadians marching for life this week, albeit uh, virtually, and they're watching you right now. Um, is there anything you'd like to say that to them in closing uh, or some words of encouragement as they're virtually marching for life? Yes, Jack, I'd just like to share with them one of the reasons why I'm running for office, and that is because I want to change the discourse in our democracy from one that demonizes people who hold different beliefs to a system that is truly that it's truly meant to be a system where we can have healthy debates about issues like life issues, including euthanasia and abortion. I truly believe in the democratic process, and I believe that conscience rights of medical professionals such as doctors should be upheld. I also believe that members of parliament should be able to vote their conscience freely on moral issues. I also believe that we can restore our democracy to a point where it respects people like you and me and respects our right and our belief that life is sacred. Uh, Dr. Lewis, you mentioned conscience rights, uh, that you would support conscience rights for, for doctors and healthcare workers. Uh, just for the sake of clarity, um, does that, uh, are you saying that uh, part of your platform that you would support legislation uh, to protect the rights, uh, the conscience rights of healthcare workers to not have to uh, either refer or participate in uh, either abortion or euthanasia? Yes, that's correct. I would do that, Jack. That is correct. The deadline to vote in the Conservative Party uh, leadership race, um, in order to, to do that, you need to have a membership. And so that deadline is tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. So if you want to be able to support Les and Lewis, you have to buy a membership.
and it's only $15 to do so. You don't even have to be 18 years old. For those 14 years old and older are able to become a member of the Conservative Party and vote in the leadership race. You don't have to be a citizen either. You can be a permanent resident. Again, just $15 and the deadline to, be, to become a member so that you can vote in the leadership race is tomorrow. Please do your part because these leader, leadership races don't come around very often. The last one was in 2017, but that was an anomaly. Again, these things are rare and we need to take advantage of them when they do occur. So please do buy your membership. And while I'm very thankful that Leslie Lewis is running because she's poised and she's thoughtful, I'm also thankful that there are other pro-lifers in the race. Um, Jack sat down with Derek Sloan as well. Pleased to introduce you now to one of those leadership candidates, the Member of Parliament for Hastings, Lennox and Addington, Mr. Derek Sloan. Let's get right into it. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about your, your career, your background. Uh, you were elected a member of parliament in 2019, defeating a pro-abortion liberal incumbent. Yay! And you're a lawyer by trade who was involved in the landmark Trinity Western University case, defending the Christian school's right to govern itself according to its own religious beliefs. And those are impressive accomplishments, Derek, but your greatest career accomplishment in my book was having the courage to run as an unapologetic, pro-life, pro-family candidate in this conservative leadership race. And as a result, you've been rewarded by being attacked by both the pro-abortion media and the establishment elite in the party, but you've stood by your principles. So Derek, would you please share with, your audi with our audience here the pro-life policies that you've announced thus far as part of your election platform? Uh, 12, uh, 12 points in the plan. The first is to rescind the Conservative Party's policy number 70, which states that a Conservative government will not support any legislation to regulate abortion. Uh, you and I were both present in Halifax, Jack, and we almost got that, uh, that policy eliminated. But as a leader, I would uh, actively promote the removal of that policy. Um, the second is unborn victims of violence law. So Cassie and Molly's law, as it's, uh, as it's been called before. Pregnant women and their unborn children are often the victims of violence or homicide, and yet there is no justice or consideration for the unborn baby. We know that that's, in the- that's, that's an important policy, Derek, if I may interject. I mean, we hear every year uh, one or two or, or perhaps more cases where um, uh, a, a pregnant mom is uh, murdered or attacked and, and the baby ends up dying as well as the mother and uh, there's no justice for the second life that was taken against the, the desires of the mother. So that's that's a great policy. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the third is ending foreign aid funding of abortion and of pro-abortion special interest groups. So that includes uh, uh, funding abortion overseas and also funding groups here at home uh, that um, uh, initiate uh, pro-abortion lawsuits and, and try and shut down free speech, things like that. Um, the fourth is to implement a Born Alive Infant Protection Act. So any baby born alive, even as the result of a botched abortion, must be given all necessary care to maintain life, including neonatal intensive care. Uh, the next is a partial birth abortion ban. So this is something that is banned in many countries. It's obviously a, a terribly barbaric practice, and it should be banned in Canada as well. Uh, the next uh, is free expression and free speech for pro-life individuals. So I would be sure to uh, lift bubble zones that, uh, that surround abortion clinics that prevent people from being able to protest there and make sure that pro-life clubs and university campuses are allowed to operate without uh, hindrance and uh, provinces that don't ensure uh, this, this type of free expression will have uh, equalization payments clawed back. And again, Derek, that's that's a much needed policy. We are seeing, you know, uh, anti pipeline, anti oil industry uh, protesters get away almost with murder. I mean, they're literally destroying private property, committing violence, uh, breaking the law uh, and the police stand by. They're not arrested. Nothing happens. Trudeau doesn't speak out against them. Nothing. Ha the provincial, even conservative governments uh, let them do it. Uh, but when a, a grandma prays quietly quietly on the public sidewalk outside an abortion facility without even saying a word. Maybe if she's a Catholic grandma pray, praying her rosary silently, she'll be arrested and could go to jail for that. Uh, that's wrong. Um, the next uh, plank I have here is ultrasound prior to abortion. 
So many women complain that information is withheld prior to undergoing an abortion. And in an effort to ensure uh, equality, I would encourage provinces to pass legislation requiring disclosure and requiring an ultrasound provided and shown to the mother prior to an abortion. Wonderful. Wonderful. The next is uh, freedom of conscience for healthcare workers. So no doctor, health practitioner, or any health facility shall be compelled to perform or refer for medical assistance in dying or abortion. And provinces that do not ensure freedom of conscience is respected will see their equalization payments clawed back. Uh, when it comes to palliative care, we know that many people seeking palliative care uh, don't get it. And uh, uh, adequate access to palliative care uh, reduces the requests for euthanasia. So, and some feel pushed into euthanasia because of a lack of this. I know that Justin Trudeau has promised several times to increase funding. I'm promising to commit $10 billion over 10 years to fund palliative care and help the most vulnerable amongst us. Much needed. That will be a great help to our seniors and those who are uh, uh, in their final moments to uh, live, a, to have a death that's truly dignified. Um, uh, and live to to uh, to its natural end. Uh, the last twelfth uh, plank here in my plan is to encourage legislation to prohibit abortion based on gender, whether male or female. Okay, wonderful. Wow, that's uh, an impressive slate of policies there. Twelve in all. Um, I'm sure our uh, March for Life participants here are are uh, very thrilled about that. Uh, would you like to say anything, uh, any words of encouragement to the tens of thousands of pro-life Canadians participating in this year's virtual National March for Life? Sure. Thank you all for what you're doing. You're marching for those who are unable to march for themselves. And your stand today is laying the foundation for this movement in Canada. Keep on marching. Courage can be costly, but compromise is fatal. Thank you, Derek. And to every Canadian watching this broadcast, I implore you to please get involved. Help us elect a pro-life leader in the Conservative Party. Now, to become a voting member, just visit www.conservative.ca forward slash join and pay the 15 bucks that it costs to get a one-year membership in the party. And it's very important, the deadline to become a voting member is May 15th. Derek Sloan has really been a, a trooper through all of this. Uh, more recently, he's been taking a lot of flack uh, from uh, his criticism over the World Health Organization's links with the Chinese Communist Party. And for the record, the World Health Organization, along with the many UN entities and agencies, they are some of the most pro-abortion organizations in the world. And now we're gonna move on to our final uh, interview that uh, Jack Fonseca conducted with another CPC leadership candidate, except this one was disqualified. And so please tune in to this interview with Jim Carajolios to uh, listen in to what he has to say about what happened. Introduce you to Mr. Jim Carajolios. Uh, Jim, I'll jump right into it because we don't have a lot of time. CLC has known you for many years as a pro-lifer who's involved in conservative politics. We also endorsed your wife, Belinda Carajalios, as a pro-life provincial MPP candidate in Cambridge, where I can happily say she won the election and now faithfully serves her constituents as an MP at Queen's Park. Very briefly, uh, in the interest of time, can you explain why you were disqualified, illegally and unethically in my view? We were removed from the ballot six days before the race was paused because Aaron O'Toole uh, his campaign put forward a complaint calling for my disqualification to a small committee uh, supposedly running this election where he claimed I uh, made Islamophobic comments for an email where I criticized his campaign chair for uh, uh, advocating for Sharia banking in the Globe and Mail. And in my shock, the committee agreed with Mr. O'Toole and removed me from the ballot. They couldn't even identify a rule that I broke. They just said it was Islamophobic. Uh, Jim, let me, let me jump in. Is there any policy in the Conservative Party policy declaration? I know the answer to this because I've read it cover to cover many times. Is there any policy that says that Conservatives shall not be permitted to criticize Sharia law or Sharia financing? So there's nothing that talks about Sharia banking for or against, but there is a policy that says we are not for cultural or religious courts or tribunals. We're for one law for all. So actually, there's a policy that supports my uh, communication. 
the long and the short of it is there is a possibility that the judge will rule that you should be reinstated. Is that correct? Uh, we've worked really hard for a month or over a month getting together all the good legal arguments and evidence. So there is a there is a chance, Jack, that we'll okay. get back on the ballot. Uh, so, Jim, you became famous for your um, uh, a couple of your campaigns, one being the Take Back Our PC Party campaign, which challenged corruption under Ontario PC leader Patrick Brown. During the Brown regime, nomination elections were being rigged many times and perhaps even most of the time to block socially conservative pro-life candidates. If you win the race, can we expect to see a similar cleanup of the Conservative Party under your leadership? Well, definitely, uh, Jack, you've known me because I've always advocated and tried to uh, stop a voter fraud within uh, the Ontario PC Party. But even federally, I've always fought really hard in the policy process and the constitutional process to ensure that uh, the rules are followed and we have a grassroots process. If they can remove me in the middle of a leadership race when I'm in third place, What's the hope for any blue conservative or pro-life conservative to run in a nomination in the future again? They will just deny anyone who has the courage to speak up. Can you please share with us the pro-life policies that you've announced thus far during the leadership race as part of your election platform? Our conservative party is not going to be funding abortions overseas. Secondly, I've also announced that I'm going to fight for caucus to have the freedom to bring forward and vote in line with uh, their conscience. We're going to have to put forward legislation that protects healthcare workers and other professionals based on their conscience and not being forced to do things that are outside of uh, their religious beliefs. And then uh, 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 the, the next conservative government we have has to make a concerted effort to put judges on the Supreme Court that are strict interpretationalists. And so those that's my uh, platform on uh, the social issues, I think it's the strongest uh, that's been presented from the leadership candidates and the one that's realistic, uh, given the constraints that we have with the democratic system and uh, the current judiciary uh, for the long term vision of a conservative movement. Now, before we close, would you care to say a word of encouragement to the tens of thousands of pro-life Canadians participating in this year's uh, National March for Life, Jim? Well, I want to say thank you to uh, pro-life uh, conservatives and conservatives at large who uh, supported our, our campaign and and it really shows the power of the conservative movement and the pro-life voice when three individuals endorsed by Campaign Life Coalition were able to raise a combined nine hundred thousand dollars to meet the ballot requirements, which were historic uh, requirements. So I just want to say uh, to conservatives and pro-life um, uh, individuals, don't give up hope. Uh, fight for a better future. Uh, fight for the future and we can't give up hope and even when times seem rough you know this is my second court case in four years with political parties to fight for democracy uh, the best is yet to come pro-lifers need to get engaged in the political process if they don't they allow the decisions to be made by those who are getting engaged in the process and our pro-life politicians, they expose themselves to so much criticism. They get the criticism from abortion lobby groups. They get the criticism from the mainstream media. And so, of course, they should be willing to do that regardless. They should just stand up for the truth. But pro-lifers should show their gratitude by supporting these politicians. We should show them that we are thankful and that we will be there for them. We will go to bat for them. So, Matt, wouldn't you agree that these politicians need our support? 100%. And one thing that I really liked about all these three candidates uh, and their platforms is that they all want to defund abortion overseas. Because Canada, under Justin Trudeau, has been a leader in the exportation of abortion all around the world. And we need to bring that and put that to an end. Uh, this past Sunday, uh, I hope many of you tuned in, but we kicked off the National March for Life Week with a pro-life film movie night featuring Obinuju Ikiocha and her documentary Strings Attached. Now when I spoke to her prior to the screening of the film, we talked about abortion funding, we talked about ideological colonization, and then we realized that our conversation was almost 30 minutes long. So we decided to actually play uh, a new part of that conversation that was not featured on Sunday today. And I also just got a message from Uju saying, I'm watching, so keep up the good work. So thank you so much, Uju, for, uh, for watching. At least one person is watching today. So uh, here's what Uju had to say. Why is it that 
Western governments are so keen on using tax dollars of their citizens to promote and commit abortions in countries where it continues to be illegal. Matt, I honestly, I think this is, um, it comes down to what I privately in my mind uh, like to think of as an unholy matrimony when two powerful uh, issues come together to become one something really ugly can come out of it if there are two you know powerful forces and um, the first one is the ideology the force of this ideology that we are finding now very much uh, spread across western countries um, the way the Western countries discuss abortion, like abortion is almost like a non-negotiable issue. Everyone saw what happened with Ireland uh, not too long ago. It's only been a year now since Ireland has been having um, if, uh, le legal abortion with, after the referendum. Uh, so it's, this issue has become a, a sine qua non issue across the West. It's abortion has to be put down as a healthcare, as progress, as women empowerment. So that's the one thing is a powerful ideology. And then on the other side, there is the money uh, and the power that money can bestow. Um, and the, the money we are finding is coming from uh, entire government budgets. A lot of the governments are giving almost 0.7% of their national budget to what they're calling, uh, uh, you know, uh, development uh, funding, they are putting it into helping places in the developing world, particularly African countries, uh, being at the top of that list. So when these two things come together, um, money is put in the, in the hands of really powerful ideologues. They then go out and they act out exactly as they know. Um, a lot of people, I have a lot of friends who are in the West who are pro-life people, who are amazing people. I'm sure a lot of people who are participating in the March for Life this year, March for Life Canada this year, are all pro-life people. So you are not the ones, but you also have in mind that the people who are right at the top of the issues, who are making the important decisions in most of these Western countries are ideologues who are definitely not pro-life in any way, shape or form. And they are so shameless that they, they will, they're ready to take their ideology um, to to wh whichever country they go to. So they are, in other words, exporting uh, a lot of these issues, uh, abortion being right at the top of the, uh, of the list. If you read the media in Canada, the mainstream media, or if you listen to, you know, Justin Trudeau's press conferences or some of his other ministers, it makes, they make it seem as if abortion rights, first of all, there's no such thing as a right to abortion. Let's just yeah. get that out of the way. But they make it seem like these abortion rights is something that the Africans are just begging for. That's all they want. And as Canadians, we need to provide these, you know, safe abortions. Again, another lie because there's no such thing as safe abortions. Absolutely. Um, and it makes it seem like everyone in the world wants abortion. So why is it that the Western politicians with Justin Trudeau, I guess, championing that cause... Why are they so obsessed with abortion? Because abortion is an issue that indicts. It indicts. If someone will go as far as uh, rejecting the reality of human life as a, when it starts, which is, it, which is from the moment of conception, we know that science has already revealed all of that. We're no longer discussing as to, as to whether a baby in the womb is a human or, or not. Science continues to show us day by day how just how human, you know, a baby in the womb is and so should be protected. So, but if uh, people within certain Western uh, communities have decided to completely ignore that, but not only ignore it, they deny it actively. And not only that, they promote the denial of it and, and they make it completely illegal to even uh, object in, in certain quarters. We know about all the bubble zones that, are, that have happened in, in some places within Western countries, for example. So they are going as far as making our pro-life uh, advocacy illegal uh, by putting all kinds of obstacles for us. If they do that and they go that far, uh, I think it's an indictment then when somebody in a neighboring country or in another country uh, would look at the same baby, the same baby 
in their country and say, you know, uh, this baby is also part of our community and we are going to protect this child. So it's an indictment because what the Trudeau administration has done, as well as you know, other politicians around them, from what I understand even in Canada, it's not only now the Libras, it's like people on all sides of the aisle. It's so disturbing sometimes when I speak to some people within Canadian politics that they are willing to follow through with this whole abortion ideology. Um, but, uh, you know, when one then completely abandons the duty to protect the most vulnerable ones within our society, it will then be an indictment when you look and you see perhaps a poorer country struggling and all that, not as glamorous as your country, going yeah. as far as saying, you know, this child uh, that is in the womb is one of us and we are going to protect the child. This is what every country had to, has the duty of doing in the first place. Uh, but if you have abdicated your duty to protect these uh, little ones, it's an indictment to see someone else doing that. So I believe that's why abortion activists, um, abortion promoting politicians, abortion supporting politicians, um, abortion organizations, that's why they go all out to fight these battles in countries that have not legalized abortion because they want uh, to completely silence the voice anywhere in the world that is raised, the voice that says that the child in the womb is one of us, and in fact is the most vulnerable of us, and so should be protected. So while Canada is pretty bad when it comes to promoting abortion, it's certainly not the only country attacking life and family. With me right now is David Mulroney. He's the former uh, Canadian ambassador to China from 2009 to 2012. So David, you would know that very well. And I think uh, Canadians and people from across the world over the past year are really starting to realize how dangerous the Chinese Communist Party is. So David, I was hoping that you could talk to us about their population control agenda and the state of freedom of religion there. I'd be happy to, and, and thank you very much for including me today. My wife Janet and I are very sorry uh, that we're not with folks in Ottawa where we have gone uh, because it's, it's simply one of the, the nicest, best, most inspiring days of our year. So we send our best wishes to everyone. What I noticed in, in China, and unfortunately, I never thought I'd have to say this, but I noticed it in Canada too, is that there's such a fundamental connection between respect for religious belief, religious freedom, having a robust religious culture and a defense of life. And China, unfortunately, offers neither. Um, the uh, just as Canada began its, uh, you know, opened its doors to abortion in 1969, the Chinese began to uh, build their family planning and uh, abortion uh, campaigns in the 1970s. What's shocking in this, though, is that was with a lot of influence from foreign uh, advisors such as the Ford Foundation, the, the usual, the Rockefeller Foundation, the UN, International Planned Parenthood. China was seen as the big objective for the international abortion lobby and industry. And by the 1980s, the one-child policy was in full, at full steam. Um, they were aborting massive numbers of, of children every year. And the international backers of this uh, like to tell people that it was voluntary, that it was helping China build its economy. It was nothing of the kind. And when finally stories began to emerge of coerced abortion, of forced abortion, of the violence done against women and, of course, against millions and millions of fetuses, uh, the international lobby got very silent. And um, the, the second thing that they began to silence as well was the growing recognition of the huge impact of sex selective abortion. And uh, that now has basically blighted China's uh, economic progress. It's now a country with a statistically abnormally large uh, population of, of men. It's led to things like the trafficking of women, the importation of brides. But it's also got, uh, it's created these very sad families where you have a husband and wife, possibly one child, supporting their parents and grandparents. So it's been a disaster for China that no one will talk about. I remember going to the University of Toronto and, and talk, trying to talk about it about 15 years ago and being basically silenced in the meeting because Canadians, the Canadian supporters of abortion did not want to hear it. So China's gone through uh, an incredibly agonizing process. 
uh, but it shows no signs of learning from it. And as you say, its influence was felt in organizations like the WHO. This international campaign against life is largely and, and very often encouraged by China, but unfortunately uh, and sadly, it's also encouraged uh, by our own government. Yes, um, I was talking to Kathy Wagenthal earlier, and it's tragic that Canada can't just get it together long enough to condemn sex-selective abortions. Um, and so we, we also have to talk about Justin Trudeau. So he's obviously very pro-abortion. He's discriminating against pro-lifers. What is the one thing that you, because there's, there's many things, but what's the one thing that you would find most concerning about what he's doing? Well, first, I, I heard your interview with uh, MP Kathy Wagenstall, and I, I just want to say, express my admiration for her and for what the other MPs in the Pro-Life Caucus are doing, because that's so important. What really strikes me, uh, well, two things about uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's actions. One is the fundamental dishonesty. And just as with the Chinese, where they use euphemisms, they call things by other names to pretend they're not doing what they're actually doing, we see the same thing here in Canada. So the, under the rubric of the feminist foreign policy, uh, all kinds of things are happening, including things that are very detrimental, of course, to, uh, to women and girls. So dishonesty is one thing. But the other thing, and this really got my attention at the time of the requirement for the attestation to get summer jobs funding, attestation that you were ideologically compliant with the government's policies when it came to abortion and when it came to ideas about gender. It's this radical attack on freedom of speech, freedom of belief, and freedom of religion. I never thought that I would see that. I'm much more worried about it now, and I see it coming from our own government. Yes, absolutely. And not only were you the uh, Canadian ambassador to China, but you were also the president of St. Michael's College from 2015 to 2018. And you took some flack for calling for the staff and students to better embrace the Catholic identity of the college. And I went to St. Jerome's University, so I'm sort of familiar with this. And I know that Catholic universities and other religious institutions really need to do better at centering life issues and ensuring that we're, we're better positioned to defend against attacks on life. And so I was wondering if you could talk about the, the state of universities right now. Sure. Um, I'd like to say that uh, before I took on the job at St. Mike's, my hair was uh, much darker, much blacker. Um, what I found, and I'm a graduate of St. Michael's, that's why I was asked to come back. It was a university that was struggling. And guess what? It was struggling. I'm struggling here. It was struggling because um, it had lost its identity. It's lost its way. So student life was uh, in crisis but also the academic life and reputation of the university was in crisis. There's a real link. Those universities that have a strong sense, those Catholic universities, of who they are, what their mission is, also tend to be very strong academically. And I've got to say that a uh, big shout out to Our Lady Seat of Wisdom uh, University in Barry's Bay. I'm a big fan of what they're doing. St. Mike's had lost its way in this respect in, in, in many, many ways. And um, we worked, I, I hired some really good people who helped me to, to work to, to change some of this. One of the things we worked on was to reach out to pro-life students and to encourage participation in the March for Life. And what I saw around the abortion issue at St. Michael's, but also I was part of the every quarter, the presidents of the Catholic universities in Canada would meet. So I saw this very much around that table was a great deal of fear in the university among academics and among administrators that they might somehow um, fall afoul of the secular powers that be. The secular powers, often Catholic universities are federated with large secular universities. Mm -hmm. And too many Catholic administrators and teachers would, would rather betray Catholic values than look somehow uh, apart or out of step with the, the, secular, um, the secular majority. So what I wanted to suggest, and what we did at, at St. Mike's was to students, students who are pro-life on, on, on campuses, Go out and find allies. For us at St. Michael's, the allies included the Archdiocese. So Cardinal Collins marched with our students when we'd go up to Ottawa for the march. We were very fortunate in terms of the Newman Center, Father Peter Tironi. We had the Sisters of Life who helped us. Uh, we also worked with uh, other educational institutions, including uh, evangelical institutions, where that, the, that respect for life, the flame for life, burned so brightly. Mm -hmm. So I'd encourage students to uh, go and see your president and ask him or her 
to support you in your pro-life efforts, and if he or she won't ask why, write to the board of the university and ask for their support as well. And find allies and be proud of your pro-life convictions. I absolutely agree, David. And with me uh, to talk about um, the, the experience of pro-life students on university campuses is now Florence Laverne. Let's roll that clip. For watching who haven't um, been on campus in maybe a, a couple of decades now, um, how would you compare the experience um, on college or university campuses to other environments in terms of how the pro-life argument is received? and how pro-lifers are treated? Oh, good question. Um, so in general, university campuses are very much pro-choice environments. Um, I mean, keeping in mind also that the majority or the, the age group that has the most abortions are university ages. So we know it's the most vulnerable group, which is also why we need to be present there. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, it's a very pro-choice environment. I think all universities have some sort of like women's center on campus with, you know, different resources or whatever of all sorts. Um, and um, those centers are typically funded by student unions. So it's like right into the university um, like system and how it functions. They have those things and yeah, very much pro-choice places. They're, you're not welcome to go there if you're pro-life. Like they're very upfront. Um, and like through those centers all typically have like posters or events going on. And it's very much pro-choice things and campaigns and posters in the washrooms everywhere. And so you see that all over the place. Um, and also like a personal experience while I was doing my master's at Ottawa U in health sciences, one of my professors is very pro-choice and not just in her beliefs. Like she explained to us that she became a medical doctor because she wanted to be an abortion provider. So I've had a few lectures from an abortionist. Um, Obviously, she was super open about her position, saying how you know great it was to work in that field. I um, mean, she was supervising a few students who were doing research in that field as well. So, um, yeah, like you feel like you're not welcome at all in certain environments. Like it depends what you're studying. Probably mathematics, you wouldn't run into these issues, um, but more health sciences or social sciences, um, you feel like you're the minority even more. But as I said, most students, I think, on campus don't really have a strong opinion. Some do. Some are very pro-life, some are very pro-choice, but most of them are just the mushy middle. So I think the average person is very easy to reach, but the institution itself is more pro-choice than it is pro-life. So. I, again, <laughs> have been there, <laughs> done that. Um, sadly, it's, it's the case kind of across Canada um, where... Yeah, the average student isn't so bad, but the institution just oppresses you. <laughs> um, so lastly, um, for the students who are watching, what advice would you have for them? Yeah, so for students, um, similar to how I got involved initially, I was just learning pro-life apologetics. That just helped me so much. I, there was no way I was going to do activism if I wasn't trained properly. I know some people that's not the case. They're just ready to get out there and um, they're going to you know, argue however they can. Um, that was not the case for me. I just needed to really know how to defend my position. So I think everybody who goes out and do some sort of activism should get some training beforehand um, just to know how to answer the common arguments that come up. And also like when you're doing activism or any sort of pro-life thing, actually. At that moment, you're the face of the pro-life movement. So you want to represent it well. It's not just defending your position, but it's the whole movement at that point. So that would probably be my first advice, to know things well, like read books. There are so many great books out there on apologetics, great videos on YouTube, and a whole bunch of different organizations that like on their websites, or they have trained staff who can go out and give training. So yeah, that would be my first um, piece of advice. And also for students specifically, get involved. Get involved somewhere. If it's you know doing some volunteer work um, with crisis pregnancy centers or um, phone calling to try and get pro-life politicians elected um, on campus, obviously, um, you know, or even in your high school, because you should have more um, pro-life clubs in high schools too. And 
those are probably just going to start if students take on the initiative of you know starting that and on campus take a look at the website or like facebook try and find if there is a club on your campus or um like as i said i worked with ncln before check out their website or get in touch with them and see if there is a club at the campus you're going to if there isn't you could be starting one so um get involved because also right that's the age demographic that's the most vulnerable we we need to go out there and do something so if you're pro-life i would say it's not enough to just be pro-life if you're not doing anything about it so that's like the extra step that i challenge every pro-lifer to do So as Florence mentioned, if you want to get active, it is really important that you educate yourself first. A great way to do that is to join our pro-life webinar taking place from 12.30 to 3 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. But if you want to take part in that webinar, you have to register today. So go to marchforlife.ca if you are a youth. It's a free webinar. I'll be doing a pro-life one-on-one presentation. Ruth Robert, who is uh, featured in our earlier montage from uh, CLC Nova Scotia, she's going to be talking about activism. Uh, CLC's global policy and advocacy advisor, Matea Murda, is going to be talking about politics. There'll be high school students. You don't want to miss it, so please register right now. But let's take a breather, right, Matt? <laughs> yes, we've been going pretty strong for the past, I think, hour and a half. I don't even know what time it is anymore. <laughs> But uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's, who's, who's still watching with us, who's with us, who's marching for life from their homes. We still have some amazing speakers lined up. We got Stephanie Gray coming up. We got the Sisters of Life. We got the producer of the Gosnell film that came out last year. Um, stick around. Thank you so much for all the comments. The live chat is just buzzing. Um, if you want to let us know where you're from and what you're doing right now, put on your pro-life t-shirt, grab a pro-life sign, send us a picture. And we will post all of these things on our Facebook page, on Twitter. Um, so, uh, so yeah, just thank you so much for, for sticking with us right now. Um, usually at the March for Life in Ottawa, the rally is only about an hour. <laughs> so I'm already exhausted. But nonetheless, let's keep going because the babies deserve our time. Right, Josie? <laughs> yes. I think that could be a new chant, a new slogan, actually. Um, so right now, we're going to pump you guys up, lift up a bit of the energy, and we will show you a highlight reel from the 2016 National March for Life. Two, one, make some noise! It's amazing to look out across this field and see so many people here for the right reasons. We know that laws are made here in Parliament. We want to be here to show the politicians that we want laws on abortion here in Canada. I welcome and I honour and I bless everyone here who has chosen to stand in unity with one heart to honour the sanctity of life. On these very steps of Parliament Hill, the late great Mother Teresa spoke the beautiful thing about the pro-life movement is that it's ordinary people doing extraordinary things for God. It's not hard to see that this Liberal government is quickly becoming the government of death. We have an estimated over 20,000 people in this crowd. If every single one of us get involved in the political sphere, we would not have a minority of pro-life politicians in our parliament. Peace Tower behind me, you will see the words where there is no vision, the people perish. Well, my vision for Canada is a vision where every single human life, from conception to natural death, is cherished and valued. It's such a pleasure to be here today. What a blessing! And thank you, God, and to our parents for giving us life. The truth is that laws come and go, but universal truths remain. We end life prematurely, either at the beginning or at the end. We miss out on God's blessing for this country. Every life matters because life begins at conception, without exception. Thank you. The March for Life, as I said earlier, is a global movement. And now I really want to give a shout out to the lateness Miss Nellie Gray. She was 
a pioneer of the movement in America, and she was also the main organizer and the founder of the March for Life in Washington, D.C. Since then, we've had marches pop up all around the world because the issue of abortion, the life and family issues, they're not you know, limited to any one country. This affects all of us because the evil one is always working very hard to ensure that life is ruined. But to lighten things up a little bit, we've reached out to several of these National March for Life organizers from the various countries around the world, and we were overwhelmed with so many amazing video submissions. We're going to show you some, uh, about three or four of them now, but we will be posting the full montage on our Facebook channel later today. So uh, enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Jeannie Mancini. I'm president of the March for Life in the United States. We are based out of Washington, D.C. Of course, today I'm coming to you from a place that's a little bit more of the beauty of Canada. I thought that a, more of a natural setting might be uplifting as we're not able to be together, sadly, during this health crisis. But know that all of us in the United States are joining together with our pro-life Canadian friends together as we march virtually to protect all life in Canada. God bless you and thank you so much for your stance on the unborn. Hi, I'm Isabel. Hi, I'm Ben. Hi, I'm Sarah. And, and we are March for Life UK. It's great to be with our Canadian brothers and sisters today for your fantastic online event. It's amazing to know that there's so many people all around the world who like us recognise and value the uniqueness of every human being right from the moment of conception and are willing to witness to this. So we have our own event happening uh, June the 13th over here in the UK. Um, it's going to be called Livestream 20 and you can catch the, all of the streaming events on our YouTube channel. Just search March for Life UK. So we have a little pro-life saying here over in the UK. It goes, life from conception. No exception. Have a fantastic day. Goodbye. <laughs> Dear organizers of the March for Life in Canada, I'm Brenda Del Rio from Mexican Campaign for Life, Que Viva Mexico. We want to send you our support and tell you that we are part of the generation that is going to see the abortion industry fall. Let's keep our spirits steady. We are the vast majority. Let us put all our effort for our little brothers who have no voice and who are discriminated against denying their human identity. The triumph is getting closer. Let's make this generation a more human generation. From Guadalajara, Mexico, our best regards. Hi. 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 We are the Dutch pro-life organization Cry for Life. Because we live in a country where abortion is legal up to 24 weeks. So once again, that full montage with all the clips that we received will be posted to our social media later today. Make sure you check that out. Now, during this pandemic, every single province in Canada has considered abortion to be an essential service. That means that while cancer surgeries are being postponed, abortion access remains the same. Abortionists are taking away the personal protective equipment that could be better used healing people, saving lives in order to kill babies. And of course, the alternative is that a woman just stays pregnant, gives birth to a healthy baby nine months later when our healthcare system isn't under as much um, pressure as it is right now. And so um, it is extremely concerning that, um, that that remains the case right now. And it reminds us that pro-abortion people do not care about protecting women. They care about protecting abortion. The abortion pill endangers women's lives, except women in rural areas, they don't necessarily have access to a hospital nearby. And with the pandemic, they might be even less likely to go seek care at a hospital. So again, this is about abortion. This is not about protecting women. And so a great example of this is Philadelphia abortionist Kermit Gosnell. Our, our March for Life speaker last year was Anne McElhiney. I spoke to her a um, couple of weeks ago about Kermit Gosnell. She's um, the author of a, bu a book on the story of Kermit Gosnell. She created a movie about it. And so uh, this is her talking about Kermit Gosnell now. The story of Kermit Gosnell was 
extraordinary on every level and on every level journalistically significant. Um, from a public health point of view, from a crime point of view, sensational point of view. Um, this was a huge story and it was basically neglected by the mainstream media. And when we discovered this story, we thought the world should know this story for all kinds of reasons. I mean, this is a horror of unnatural proportions, but it also sheds an incredible light on a number of issues. So, I mean, you know, for those who don't know, and it's always surprising me how many people who don't know, Kermit Gosnell was an abortion doctor who worked in a clinic in West Philadelphia for over 30 years. And his modus operandi was to deliver babies alive and to cut their necks with scissors. And he did this for three decades. Um, for 17 of those years, no one walked into the clinic from the Department of Health in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. No one investigated, despite the fact that there were um, voluminous uh, uh, criticisms of him and complaints about him. And in those years, two women died. Karnamaya Monger, uh, a Bhutanese refugee who had come to America and was here only four months in the United States uh, when she went to Kermit Gosnell's clinic and ended up dead. And Samika Shaw, a young African-American mother who also died as a result of a botched abortion at Kermit Gosnell's clinic. Neither of those deaths inspired anyone from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's health department to go and inspect the clinic. Um, other things about Kermit Gosnell, he kept trophies. I mean, he was like, a, you know, your, your, your typical serial killer. And I've unfortunately met Kermit Gosnell. I've been in the prison. I've interviewed him for many hours. And he is exactly what you would almost like central casting for um, a serial killer. He kept trophies. Um, he kept a lot of the, you know, when the, when the cops eventually raided his clinic, there were 47 bodies, uh, the remains of 47 children who had died there. Uh, in various containers, and the way that those bodies were treated in self is a is a you know cries to heaven for vengeance, I, as my mother would say. Um, you know, he had them in kitty litter containers. He had them in you know the cut off tops of like um, uh, milk cartons, it just dumped everywhere, uh, unceremon unceremoniously dumped everywhere. They were piling up in the basement, um, and not only that, but he also cut the feet off children and kept them in jars. And so when police detective. Uh, Jim Wood went into that premises with a number of other uh, detectives. This is what they discovered in the room where people had their peanut butter and jello sandwiches. He had row upon row upon row of these children's feet with the identifying mark of their mother's name. Um, so this was on every level, on every possible level, this was a massive news story. However, the mainstream media decided to completely ignore it. Basically, they completely ignored it. And, you know, they say they covered it, but it's a lie. Kermit Gosnell got away with what he did for 30 years because our government, the media, they do not care about protecting women. They care about protecting abortion. And so it is no surprise that now today, even though uh, keeping abortion facilities open risks spreading the virus further, that they remain open regardless, that they remain a priority in Canada. And that's because abortion is what these people care about, not about the health and well-being of women and others. And so this might be very depressing, but thankfully I was also able to sit down with the one and the only Stephanie Gray, who was on our EWTN special earlier, and she offers hope to us. Our response to this death and destruction, both at the beginning and the end of life, should be love, it should be care, it should be concern. So here's Stephanie now. First question is about uh, Love Unleashes Life. Essentially, what was your motivation um, behind creating that ministry? And what essentially does Love Unleashes Life mean? Mm, great question. So yes, it's the name of my ministry and my book. And the idea came out of an experience I had more than 10 years ago when my mom and I went on a volunteer vacation to Eastern Europe, to Romania. And we worked with children at a failure to thrive clinic. And there was one little girl in particular who uh, was six months old and weighed only six pounds. So, I mean, she was smaller than most newborns. Um, she had severe fetal alcohol syndrome, a very uh, terrible bed sore on her body, and she was completely emotionless. So when you would stroke her cheek or try to tickle her neck, she wouldn't react. Not a sound, not a cry, no emotion. And my mom was the main caregiver for her during our time there. 
And my mom was the first person to care for her when she had just been taken out of isolation. So really her, her most recent and perhaps even first encounter with touch and connection was through my mom. And within a couple of days of my mom rocking her and holding her and singing to her, suddenly this little girl came alive. If you tickled her, she smiled. Um, if, if, you, if she wanted attention, she cried, which was significant because she didn't cry prior to our arrival because she had been taught if, if you cry, people don't respond. So the fact that she cried was a beautiful sound because she knew she would be attended to. And so that little reflection really made me think that that the love she received from my mom uh, literally, and in, in, you could also say figuratively, unleashed her life. Her little spirit came alive. And as I thought about that, it occurred to me that in my many years of dialoguing with abortion supporters, I have often found that people who are hostile and critical and mean towards myself or other pro-lifers who've been doing outreach have a tendency to soften and be more receptive to what we're trying to communicate when they sense we actually respect them, that we are tender to them, that we are compassionate towards them, that we won't meet them where they're at. If they're mean, we won't be mean. If they swear, we won't swear. And when they start to experience our true love for them as people, even if we don't love what they do or the arguments that they make, I have seen that unleash also their lives. And it made me think that as pregnancy care centers often point out that if you focus on the woman in crisis and really journey with her and let her know that she's loved, not only will you unleash her, her life spiritually and emotionally, but you will literally unleash the life of her child and she'll decide to carry it to term. So I really wanted that whole philosophy to be the foundation on which my, my new ministry was focused. I appreciate that so much because I know for my personal faith, the understanding of God being love was, was crucial to everything, I think, um, fitting into place. And so I, I'm very thankful that you're involved in this ministry. And I think people um, are, are well aware that you talk about abortion, but you also talk about assisted suicide. So I'd be very interested in knowing if there's someone who um, has lost the will to live. Maybe it's because of fear. Maybe it's because of suffering. How in, in that circumstance can love unleash life? Hmm. I think when whenever we're dealing with someone whose spirits are very down, who is depressed, who has no will to live, we want to very much be present. Uh, we want to be in their presence, holding their hand, being a listening ear, remember, remembering that we have two ears and one mouth, and really allow them to share why they are despairing, what pain they're in, even if it's not physical, it could be emotional, and really allow them the space to share and to share freely and to be a good listener and someone who asks probing questions because it's through us asking them questions that we will help them explore what perhaps is below even their initial expressions and concerns and so forth. The other thing that I think is important is the insight of one of my favorite authors, Dr. Viktor Frankl, who wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning. And Dr. Frankl was a Holocaust survivor as well as a psychiatrist. And one of the observations he made, having experienced profound suffering, having been surrounded in the concentration camps by people who were experiencing profound suffering, some of whom lost their will to live and attempted and succeeded in killing themselves in the concentration camps by running into the electric barbed wire fence and electrocuting themselves, uh, or afterwards in his profession as a psychiatrist where he had despairing patients coming to him. Dr. Frankel observed that despair is suffering without meaning. And his point was essentially, if you think about despair, that's someone who has lost their will to live. And so what his point was is, the way we help someone find a will to live is to help them find meaning in the situation that they're in. And if you think about that sentence, despair is suffering without meaning, one thing Dr. Frankel did was he put a mathematical equation to that phrase and he summarized it as D equals S minus M. And Frankel's point was that S, suffering, is a universal human experience. All of us have suffered, all of us will suffer. 
But whether or not we despair or lose our will to live in light of the presence of suffering is entirely dependent on whether we can find meaning in that suffering. And so Frankel's whole point was, if we can help people find meaning, not just in their suffering, but even because of their suffering, then we will restore will to live. Before the health crisis pandemic hit the whole entire world in the face and all these lockdowns have been happening, uh, we were actually planning on having Stephanie Gray be our Kino Rose dinner speaker. Uh, it's funny how things turn out, but we are so grateful to her for, for still being able to contribute to this whole week. She offered a prayer during the candlelight vigil. She was able to be one of our top panelists at the EWTN special. And now we thank her so much for contributing to this virtual rally with that wonderful interview. Um, there are so many pro-life heroes out there. And uh, when we embarked on this mission of bringing the march virtually to Canadians, uh, we had some amazing submissions from some of our friends south of the border who have been involved in the pro-life movement for many, many years. And um, we collected so many videos. And unfortunately, we can't play them all today, right now on this live stream, but we will be posting a full montage on our Facebook page. But in the meantime, check out two or three of these videos coming from our friends in the States. My name is Autumn Lindsay, A-U-T-U-M-N. L-I-N-D-S-E-Y. Hey everybody, it's Autumn Lindsay with Students for Life and I just wanted to give you a few words of encouragement. I know this year the theme of your march is Be Not Afraid and I think that is perfectly fitting because I know that feeling, a feeling unsure or uneasy about stepping out of our comfort zone and speaking up for the preborn. But I want to encourage you and remind you that there are millions standing with you in this cause for the preborn. We support you and we are so excited for you. I hope you guys have an amazing experience at the March for Life 2020. Hi friends, it's Father Frank Pavone, Director of Priests for Life, the church's largest pro-life ministry. We are united with you, our Canadian friends, in what is the number one urgent priority in the world today, ending abortion. The world will reject abortion only when the world sees abortion. So continue to expose it. And remember, we're not just working for victory, we're working from victory. Victory is our starting point because Christ is risen, death is conquered, abortion is conquered in Him. Hey everybody, Michael Knowles here from just on the other side of your southern border. And I want to commend all of you on the tremendous work that you are doing. You know, here in the US and Canada, we like to consider ourselves very civilized. And yet, there are only four countries on earth that permit abortion after viability for any reason whatsoever. You know what those countries are? North Korea, most evil regime probably ever. China, pretty close up there, actually maybe worse when you factor in the numbers, than the United States and Canada. When it comes to questions of human dignity, you do not want to find yourself on the same small team as North Korea and China. So obviously, we've all got our work cut out for us. You in particular in Canada do, because Canada has just about no abortion laws whatsoever. And so thank you so much for the work you're doing. And uh, please, please keep it up. And hopefully someday in the near future, we'll be able to call our countries civilized again. Thank God for the Daily Wire, am I right? Uh, it's also not the only um, pro-life publication amplifying voices of pro-lifers. I happen to write for the interim newspaper, Canada's Life and Family Paper, which arrives on readers' doorsteps on a monthly basis. I'm highly biased, of course, but I think it's worth a subscription to keep yourselves informed. But Matt, does there exist a free daily pro-life <laughs> news source? As a matter of fact, there does, Josie. LifeSite News has been around for almost 20 years now, just over 20 years, and they are viewed millions of times on a daily basis, providing news that you will never see or never find anywhere else in the mainstream media. I had a chance to speak with the co-founder and editor-in-chief of LifeSiteNews.com, John Henry Weston. Let's watch. Henry, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Why is reliable and accurate pro-life media so important in today's world? Well, we are getting 
everything we receive in terms of news and information filtered through pro-abortion media. Now, they, of course, always call themselves neutral. You know, the, the uh, CBC. If anyone really thinks that the CBC is neutral, they really need to uh, examine what they're doing. The CBC is totally pro-abortion. They don't say that, though. And so when you have a hidden bias, when you have a bias that is unexpressed, people start to take that as if it's legitimately true. And it is actually formative in people's minds. What's happening today is that the language of choice, oh, we're pro-choice, pro-woman, by being pro-abortion, is becoming normal. And that's very damaging, not only to you know, people out there in general, but also to our own children who have to view this nonsense. So to have a media outlet that is authentically true on the values of life, a family, a faith and culture is essential. It's essential for us too, because we do get taken in by the media that we consume. It does affect us. It doesn't have no effect. So it's absolutely essential. It's needed for to provide even the truth of what's actually happening. When we started the uh, March for Life in 1997, it was right around the time LifeSite started as well. And we were there with the first March for Life. Of course, LifeSite was founded out of Campaign Life Coalition. So we were all there and the media would report nothing. You know, thousands of people, sometimes tens and 20,000s of people show up and the media says nothing at all. You know, I often make a joke, you know, people are going home from work and they're delayed in traffic by a long, long time and they get home and the wife goes, hey, where have you been? Oh, it was this massive march. It was ridiculous. And then on comes the evening news. Nothing. And the wife looks over the husband and says, yeah, right. That was the delay. You know, it's nuts. I've used that one before, John Henry. <laughs> <laughs> Lifestyle News is home to a lot of news that will get you angry and riled up, right? Because there's a lot of bad things happening in this world. And I'm glad that you guys are willing to write about these things. But at the same time, LifeSite News is also the home to some of the most uplifting, life-affirming stories that you will definitely not find anywhere else. I mean, the best example of this is the extensive coverage that you guys give to the various marches for life around the world, right? Okay. Uh, pro-life, pro-life bills, pro-life legislation, uh, pro-life efforts. And not just in North America, but all around the world. Can you maybe elaborate more on some of these uplifting stories and why they're so valuable to the narrative? Absolutely. So first of all, the movement for life is huge around the world. The marches for life are so encouraging, so uplifting. And LifeSite has been on the forefront of going to the marches for life all around the world and filming them, photographing them, reporting on them, what's going on. It is so encouraging that, of course, Marches for Life all started in the United States. And LifeSite actually takes all of our staff to the March for Life at least once, but reporters go often because it's so uplifting. You're not there by yourself. You're there with hundreds of thousands of other people. And you always feel old, even when I was a young man doing this. LifeSite started nearly 25 years ago now, so I was a very young man. And I still felt old over there because it was unbelievable. The number of young people there, bright and energetic and it's just phenomenal now we do that all over the world we, we're at the march for life in rome we're at marches for life throughout latin america and we get footage now we're not a huge news agency obviously so we can't fly everybody all over the place but we work with pro-life groups all over the world who send us video photos and beautiful information on what they're doing and it's just awesome to be able to publish the encouraging stories to publish about the saints like the Go and look at some of the people who run the Marches for Life. We remember Nellie Gray. She's gone now to her eternal reward. But there are people who run Marches for Life all over the world who are just fantastic. And what's amazing is I've been very blessed. I've, I've gone around the world. I've met pro-life leaders all over the place. I really, honestly, truly believe I'm meeting with saints. These are people who are the most awesome lovers of life, lovers of family, strong in their faith, and ready to stand for life despite any cost. There's a tendency to remove faith from pro-life discourse in today's world. So I'm really grateful that LifeSite News has found the perfect balance of reporting about faith issues, life and family issues, combining it all, and giving the world something that's authentic, accurate, and uh, 
and positive and hopeful. There are a few other people um, better positioned to speak about um, the role of faith in the pro-life movement than the Sisters of Life. The Sisters of Life are a group of sisters that take an extra religious vow to uh, protect and enhance the sacredness of all human life. They do this through prayer and through counseling women in crisis pregnancies. I sat down with them to talk about their ministry and how it's been affected by COVID-19. Grace and Sister Jordan Rose, it is wonderful that you're able to join me here today. My first question would be um, if you can elaborate on what you do in your ministry and also how your ministry has been impacted by COVID-19, for instance, whether you've seen a difference in the number of cases or the type of cases, and if you've had to change how you minister to these women. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Well, the realities of COVID have definitely affected us. We're all in this together. And yet our ministry it remains active, open, and of course essential. You know, the human heart will always need to know that it's loved uh, and made for love. Uh, you know, and whether that's when life takes a sudden turn, if it's an unexpected pregnancy or a pandemic like we're all in, uh, we all definitely experience that. And that mm-hmm. And for anyone who is meeting us for the first time or longtime friends, we, the Sisters of Life, uh, we're a religious community of women, like Josie just mentioned. And we like to say we're in love with love, capital L. And we've been captivated by the truth of the beauty of the human person, created in God's image and likeness. And it's a truth, you know, that's so easily forgotten today. We take it for granted, but God never forgets. And he always sees our worth, how unique and unrepeatable each of us are. And we believe that your life matters. So we exist so that every person can encounter the goodness of their own life Mm -hmm. and the life of every person. Mm -hmm. It's true. And our main work, as we said, uh, is prayer. It's actually where all of our missions flow. You know, we serve women who are pregnant and in need, as Josie said. We also host retreats. Uh, We speak about the dignity of the human person. And we also have a mission of hope and healing uh, for those suffering after abortion, inviting them to receive the Lord's gift of mercy, always an offering. Uh, and this source of our ministry, our prayer, has increased 100-fold these days, um, of course. So this, we're seeing there's so much to lift up to the Lord in prayer. And we've received so many intentions. So we're very intently praying for each one of you. One way to show that is that we typically spend about four hours a day in prayer. And now we've increased our times of prayer, take on the Divine Mercy Chaplet, things like that, specifically to pray for an end to COVID and all of those that are suffering from it. Mm-hmm. And our accompaniment with women is actually just as active, if not more, you know, mm-hmm. during these days. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just looks a little different. You know, we've been journeying primarily over the phone with each other as a source of support, encouragement, love, hope. It's not the same as meeting a person in person, but so much can be communicated through even just a word of love and compassion. Mm-hmm. And we've also seen that the women who are pregnant and in need, mm-hmm. as well as those who have suffered an abortion, are still connecting with us either by word of mouth or a search online, somehow they find us. And more importantly, they find Jesus and the hope that he offers. That's true. And what's new on our front is that we've stepped up our online presence, uh, which brings us together now, which is a great gift. And the sharing of the good news of God's love and interest in each one of us by way of things like our YouTube channel, we have a new podcast and many more things that you could check out on our website. Joining us now is my colleague, uh, friend, CLC Campaigns Manager, David Cook. David Cook was with Citizen Go for many years, and of course, we thank Citizen Go for being one of the sponsors of this National March for Life. They do wonderful work. Um, But what I want to touch upon today with you right now, David, is this. The, The element, the physical element of protesting and speaking out against the social injustice is so important. I mean, this year we can't be on Parliament Hill. We can't rally. We can't picket. We can't chant and walk up and down downtown Ottawa with our signs. We can't create ruckus in a way, right? Peacefully, of course. But we can't do those things. And yet, as a pro-life movement, the physical element of expressing our views and witnessing to life is such a foundational element of what we do. Now, since the whole world is on lockdown, and we may be still for weeks to come, hopefully not longer, but How can pro-lifers continue to spread that message of life, continue to lobby their elected officials, continue to influence the public discourse from their homes, for example? Well, we have a great opportunity now, Matt. Um, 
because in a way, um, since we're all at home or most of us are at home with uh, a fair bit of time on our hands, uh, we have the opportunity to get to know our local political leaders and to engage with them perhaps as we never have before. We can certainly do that in a number of ways, reaching out, of course, by, by phone, uh, reaching out by uh, snail mail, the old-fashioned way. But, of course, we have all these new new technologies that, that we can employ for the cause of life uh, using email, using social media. And, of course, uh, we have uh, at Campaign Life Coalition um, different tools to help you, uh, to help uh, people uh, engage with their politicians uh, via petitions or uh, sending an email, an action alert email, uh, or various other ways uh, to connect. So uh, we're, we're, we want to help people do that, and, and uh, there's a number of ways that we can do that. Yeah, and of course, we can always do it the old-fashioned way, which is pick up a phone and call our elected official, right? Um, I mean, so much, so much of pro-life activism starts in our own communities, right? With our own elected officials. I mean, they're the ones trying to fight for our vote every election, right? So it is our duty as pro-life Canadians to build a relationship with our elected official. If they are pro-abortion, well, we have to challenge them on that. If, you know, they're kind of on the fence, they don't really want to touch the issue, we need to encourage them to, to speak out. And if they are pro-life and they are active and they are speaking on their convictions in the House of Commons, then we have to remain with them and encourage them and thank them and, and be with them because we all know that, you know, politics is a very hard job. And I've heard from many former MPs that it's quite lonely to be in Ottawa as a pro-life MP. So we really need to be with them. David, what, I, I want to ask you one thing. For someone who has never picked up the phone or emailed their MP or their MPP or their MLA or the MHA, how do they do that? How do you start? Because I know it is a bit intimidating to, 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 to have those conversations. Well, just, you know, like the theme of our March for Life this year, be not afraid. I mean, we have the truth on our side and uh, ultimately God is on our side. We don't have to be afraid. And we have to realize that those politicians, uh, they need our votes and they're looking uh, at the, um, you know, the the public square and, and what uh, voices are out there. And we need to have our voice out there and we just need to speak up and, and just simply say uh, what we believe and to do it in a polite way, uh, do it in a bold and courageous way. And uh, don't be afraid. Uh, pick up the phone, send an email, uh, s sign a petition, and uh, they will hear. They will listen. Even though, you know, the media paints a picture that, uh, you know, our voices are irrelevant. You know what? It, each voice is a vote. It's very relevant. And they will be listening. Yeah, definitely. And even in today's like social media, hyper, you know, technology world, MPs often tell us that something that they always look forward to is reading a traditional style handwritten letter. Those letters do go a long way. They do. And it is uh, absolutely free to write your MP in Ottawa. Just uh, send it to uh, send it to his uh, his name in a uh, care of parliament uh, in, in Ottawa and it will get to him. No stamp required. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah, definitely. So let's how about we send everyone watching today on their first action item, their first Camp in Life action item. That is find out who your MP is. You can go to our website, campinglifecoalition.com and write them a letter, write them an email, or maybe even call them first thing tomorrow and talk to them about the life issues. What do you think about that? What do you think about that? That's great. It's a great idea. We need to do that. Simple. Awesome. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, right now, I believe we will be cutting to a highlight reel from the 2015 National March for Life in Ottawa.
it's great to be here once again with you and with EWTN bringing the National March for Life Canada right here in Ottawa. Right behind us is Parliament Hill. This is the place where laws are made, or should I say, where laws are struck down. So this is the 18th March, and uh, they've been wonderful, wonderful events as more and more young people uh, come to the understanding of what abortion is all about. I have begged for and received forgiveness from God for deliberately taking the innocent life of my unborn child. Increasingly, I'm aware that life will win because life comes from God, the author and finisher. I willingly embrace every opportunity to be silent no more. This is the largest group we've ever had at the March for Life. Let's get back. But six uh, years ago, we had a choice. We had a choice whether to have this child or not. But I, I'm really glad that we have chosen, me and my wife have chosen, to have life. And here she is right now. Wow, wow, again. Everyone has their inspiration for being here today. One you can see is in my arms. Her name's Isabel. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the subject of my other book, famously said, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. By the grace of God, speak the truth of this madness, of this horror, of this murder. Speak that truth in love. Thou shalt not kill. That's simple, it is profound. It is something we need to reflect upon and we need to live and we need to affirm. I greet you all. I bring you greetings from my home province of Newfoundland and Labrador. In our own constitution of the Anglican Network of Canada, we have written in respect for human life as one of our main clauses. But Canadians are rising up and I'm very uh, excited today. Je suis ici avec George Bouchami, Campaign Quebec V, who has collected a, a, a petition with over 2,000 names of it from Quebecers who are opposed to euthanasia. I am very happy to receive that from him. I want you to let all the MPs know, not just the ones that are here today, that this is not a good idea and that you don't support it. Let them know. Send a strongly worded email or letter to your member of parliament about the Supreme Court decision. There was a lady a little while ago that was proclaiming my body, my right, and she's right. But we're just here to, to consider that other body, that other child that doesn't have an ability to speak. We're here to ask you to consider that. Always remember that history is on the side of justice and democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, history is on your side. I stand before you today as a Canadian woman who doesn't need to take my shirt off to get my point across. We stand here today as young pro-life Canadians, not only as a witness, but as a threat to all those MPs sitting inside this very building behind us who refuse to give human rights to all human beings. When we wonder how many children we should have, how do we decide? Let life win! When we, these politicians decide what to vote on, what do they decide? Let life win! And when we go to vote for them, we decide, let life win! God bless you! Join me in saying our slogan for today, let life win! As is evident from these montages of marches from previous years, the Silent No More testimonies of men and women who regret their abortions is a staple of every march every year. And so we've included testimonies from last year's March for Life to be introduced by the Canadian Silent No More Awareness Campaign Coordinator Angelina Steenstra. But make sure that you stick around for after these testimonies because Matt and I will be wrapping up and you don't want to miss that. 
Hello, my name is Angelina Steenstra, and I'm the National Coordinator of the Silent No More Awareness Campaign. The campaign seeks to reach out to men and women that are hurting after abortion. The ripple effect continues to go out across this nation. Many men and women hurt after abortion, as do extended family, the community at large. If you know someone who's hurting after an abortion, please direct them to a post-abortion healing program. And we'd like to share with you the testimonies that were given last year at the March for Life. So I'd like to introduce to you Julia Shamoski from Toronto and Scott Miller from Winnipeg. I stand here today to tell you that I regret my abortion. This, this is how it started. In 1976, at the age of 21, I was an independent, healthy woman who was sexually active and who suddenly had to deal with the consequences of living that life. I was pregnant. But my situation also involved a new job, school debts, no savings, not married. My peers were single and childless, and childless, and these all affected my reaction that Abortion was the only choice I considered, and it would be my secret. I placed my trust in a doctor I found, and the abortion took place in a major hospital under anesthetic, and everyone, including me, played our part in this procedure to get it over and done with, and I then returned to work the next day, and the assumption was I was okay. But 10 years later, after marriage and following the birth of my wonderful children, I found that I was experiencing nightmares, insecurity, distrust, anxiety, and decision. I gradually became less and less able to manage all the basic tasks of day-to-day -day living, and my life was spiraling down into depression. And for the next 12 years, I, I went from therapy to therapy, these did not help. My marriage failed. My full-time job failed. Why couldn't we get to the root cause? Well, 23 years after the, the abortion, that secret of mine was exposed. When I read these words, if you're depressed from having had an abortion, help is available. Well, my, my entire body was frozen. Depression, abortion, abortion, depression. At that moment, my body knew the truth that my conscience had to deal with my choice. The abortion had changed me. I managed to gather my courage. I made the call for help, and I shared my secret. I journeyed with other men and women through a healing process in a confidential, welcoming group that focused on post-abortion trauma. I learned my baby was real. I named her Marissa, and I finally let myself grieve the loss of her life. My body and my soul had been waiting for so long to grieve. I repented of this sin of my choice and I received forgiveness. And I've been integrating the healing process, you know, including issues of trust and decision-making. I returned to full-time work. It's now been 20 years. And an amazing outcome is that I experience joy in my life with my family, with friends, and with you. I regret my abortion. I don't want you to suffer as I did. And that is why I am silent no more. 40 years ago, my girlfriend told me she was expecting a child. I immediately became concerned about getting my life together in order to deal effectively with the responsibilities that would be involved. Because the condition of my life at that time was not good, I became filled with anxiety as I attempted to face the responsibilities that were before me. I never verbally pressured or suggested that my girlfriend have an abortion. I believe she eventually decided to encourage me to go along with an abortion for two main reasons. 
My poor emotional, spiritual, and psychological condition made her uneasy with bringing a child into the world. The doctor reduced the reality of the humanity of the child, claiming she was just a fetus. My girlfriend's encouragement for me to go along with the abortion, coupled with my own lack of self-confidence, led me to agree with her decision to do that. I thought that in some small way I was helping her by going along with her desire. My girlfriend sub subsequently went to an abortion clinic in the United States and had the abortion. As a statement of agreement to my dismal abilities, lack of belief in myself to be an adequate parent, I stayed home. Wrapped up in the uselessness I convinced myself that I possessed. When she returned to Canada from the abortion clinic, I felt an emptiness and a fear. The knowledge that I had a child was still there, but the child was gone. The abortion had not taken away the reality that I was a father. It simply took away the reality that I was the father of a child living here on earth. I had lost a child and so had she. And we never discussed what happened at the abortion clinic until some time later. We stayed in our relationship with the veneer that nothing had happened until one day she broke down and shared the trauma that she'd been through. I realized then I had not helped her at all by allowing her to make the choice that she did. I couldn't face her any longer because of the confusion and self-recrimination that I felt and I eventually left. But the knowledge of her pain and of the lost child never left me. I turned to alcohol to deal with the emotional complications of my guilt and anger and loss, but it didn't help. I eventually went to a priest and confessed my sin of abortion and involvement to him, and he reassured me of God's forgiveness. As time went on, I found more healing through helping fatherless children. The healing increased as I became involved in post-abortion healing weekends, helping men and women who are post-abortive. My involvement in a maternity home that has contributed to saving the lives of eight babies furthered the healing process even more. I discovered that truly helping vulnerable pregnant women like my girlfriend was not to abandon them to the lie that their baby is not human and that an abortion would be a painless solution. Truly helping them would be encouraging and supporting them like we did at the maternity home to feel confident about bringing their baby into the world. The emotional results of that approach is bringing the healing that I really needed. So I know that abortion is not the answer. That's why I'm silent no more. Thank you. So those testimonies, of course, were very moving, and we thank those individuals for sharing those with them. They're, they're honestly so courageous for being able to do that. And uh, thank you again for everyone who's been tuning in today and for the whole March for Life week, actually. We've had a jam-packed week. We hope that you have enjoyed the pro-life movie nights, uh, the candlelight vigil, which I thought was absolutely beautiful last night, the EWTN Pro-Life Special, the, the National Mass for Life, and all the other religious services uh, that, uh, that took part in this National March for Life Week. We thank everyone, uh, especially our sponsors, uh, our donors, uh, the whole pro-life movement as a whole. Uh, we are so thankful to everything you have done uh, and everything you continue to do. Um, this March for Life is, week is not over yet, though, because tomorrow... There is a youth, pro-life youth webinar, a youth webinar for youth, hosted by youth, organized by youth, including Margie Mountain. <laughs> that was a joke from earlier in the show. You have to watch that whole thing on YouTube once it's up again to get that joke. But nonetheless, uh, sign-ups and registrations end tonight at midnight. And of course, we will be wrapping up the virtual National March for Life Week with a free screening of the beautiful movie, Because of Gracia, 
uh, along with a conversation with film director Tom Symes. So you can tune in to that on our YouTube channel at 8 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. And make sure that you don't forget about the action items that David Cook mentioned. Um, again, please engage with your MPs. This, this can't stop just at the end of this week. You have to work year round. And then also um, buy your Conservative Party membership. The deadline is tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. The cost is $15. Support Leslie Lewis, support Derek Sloan, and potentially Jim Carajalios if he can make his way back into the race. Um, again, you can just be 14 years or, or, or older to get a membership. You don't have to be a citizen, can be just a permanent resident too. It's so important that you get engaged. And now Matt, can people still submit photos of them watching yes, the march? Yes, definitely. We've been getting some amazing photos of all of you watching and enjoying and experiencing this National March for Life from your homes. We've been getting people wearing t-shirts with their signs. Um, we will most likely compile all of them tonight <laughs> uh, if we don't pass out. But nonetheless, we'll compile them tonight and uh, we will be posting slideshow montages and all the other uh, montages, video montages that were submitted to us from leaders from all across the world and March for Life organizers, as well as our amazing American pro-life friends and pro-life warriors down south of the border who submitted their videos. Um, we thank you so much for joining us. Uh, like Josie said, we need to be engaged year round. And when it comes to our federal elections and our leadership races in politics, we don't just want a seat at the table. We demand a voice. So be not afraid, Canada. Thank you so much for joining us. And we will close, I guess. Yes, in... a closing reflection from Father Mark Goring. I love Canada. I, I, I was born in Canada, grew up in Canada, fishing in the Quebec hills, uh, motorcycled across this country. And part of my zeal for the March for Life is because I want to see this country honoring God and, and, and protecting the most vulnerable in this country. We want Canada to be a country where, where, where God is, is honored, where, where the sacredness of life is protected. We want God to look at Canada and, and say, wow, look at those good people who, who obey my commands and, and who love the most weak and the most vulnerable. We want to be proud of our country. We want to be proud of Canada. We don't want to be ashamed of being part of a country that doesn't respect the most vulnerable, that doesn't take great pride in, in, in being a protector of the little ones. We do have to stand. We need to fight. We need to fight by, by making our voices heard and saying no. We can't treat small, helpless people in this way. And this goes for all people, from the first moments of conception to natural death. We have to stand for the rights of these people. I've heard this call in my heart, and that's why I march. So for our closing prayer service, please tune in at 5.45 p.m., just right after the end of, the, of this live stream. The Shepsky Institute for Eastern Christian Studies is going to be holding that beautiful, beautiful prayer service, again, just in a matter of moments. So please don't miss that. And you can find that on the March for Life Canada YouTube page. It's starting in a few minutes. And uh, we thank them for offering this beautiful prayer service as a closer for this national March for Life. And before we wrap up, before we say our final goodbyes, we just want to say on behalf of Campaign Life Coalition and on behalf of Kevin Dunn and his whole team at Dunn Media who did a phenomenal job helping us out all week long with putting every show together, all the programming, all the technical aspects of putting on this virtual National March for Life. We thank them and uh, what do we got to say? We thank you. We, we thank, thank you. you. Um, and again, we couldn't do this without you. Um, this is a grassroots organization, so we appreciate your support immensely. Be not afraid, Canada. All the best. Bye. Bye. Take care.